Hello, welcome to Behind the Scenes of AV Rant. Uh, this is the live recording session, so if you're seeing this warning at the beginning of the video while you're watching this, uh, just be warned, all this is is our live uh, Skype feed, so there might be technical issues, and there's a cleaned up version that posts later in the week with times in the show notes for uh, all the questions. So you have been warned, this might be whatever the tech allows it to be. And I think that's all running, and that says it's recording, and that says it's recording. So yes, Tom can start when he pleases. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, gosh, anything happened this past week in the world? Good grief. <laughs> We're not going to dwell on it. We're here to talk about home theater, but holy that cow. That mine. Yes, kids are home. Nobody's going anywhere. Right. Everybody's locked down. Yeah. It's uh, it's a mess. It uh, is. I, I mean, I felt I you know we a couple of weeks ago everybody was joking about it, and my everybody I mean United States people. Well, because and now the, the previous outbreaks that we've had in years past have not led to this. What we're going through now, it has not led to total shutdowns, borders closing, all events of every imaginable kind canceled. I can't imagine what WrestleMania with no crowd is going to be. Zero fans versus 70,000. That's going to be yeah. a strange WrestleMania. But, I mean, yeah. Anyway, who knows? You know what? Home theaters are a great thing to have right now, aren't they? <laughs> My it's about the only thing I can think. <laughs> uh, and uh, The only reason that I'm not basically taking the podcast off because I have to deal with my children 24-7 yes. right now is because... I figure if ne if not now, when yeah. do people need advice about how to set up their home theaters? And if anything, you know? we're ever going to bring about uh, day and date release of uh, you know theatrical releases via some kind of streaming service or just you know purchasing it on Vudu or iTunes or something like. Now would be the time, you know, if this drags on for any length of time. It's not like the movie studios are going to not release the movies they've made at all. They're going to recoup that recoup that money somehow. And if people can't go to the theaters. Send it home. I guess. So this is A.V. Rant, the podcast that helps you answer. Oh, man, I am discombobulated already. I have had one sip of coffee. We'll see. <laughs> we answer your home theater and A.V. We questions. To so get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask us by emailing us a question at avrant.com. You can go to avrant.com. Leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash A.V. Rant podcast. Uh, YouTube.com slash A.V. Rant to find our videos. And uh, contact Rob directly. It's Rob at avrant.com. And my... I'm getting text messages like crazy, so I'll be looking okay. at my watch for those of you watching the YouTube. And you thing, know what? If, if Tom has to cut out, uh, I'll I'll fly solo again. I don't care. We're we're gonna we got a yeah. huge backlog, so we're gonna try and get through what we can. There's a not insignificant chance that my ten year old son will pick a fight with one of my other right. two sons and start screaming his head off, and I'll have to leave to deal with that. Plus, I have something to do at noon that cannot wait, That's right. and I might leave a few minutes I am early. Prepared just to mix for up. all eventualities. Yes, so I apologize. The podcast is important to me. Those of you that seem to think that this that occasionally will comment that why does Tom prioritize other things on top of the podcast? But he's only been doing it for twelve years straight, folks. He clearly doesn't care. I don't care. <laughs> this is yeah. This is, no so. credit. No credit right. for keeping something consistently going for twelve years. No. The one time you got to cut out, guy, yeah, you just don't care anymore. I don't care. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> My ten-year-old may, in fact, stab somebody. It is, a, it is yeah. a, it is a possibility. They have only been locked in the house together for like two days. I missed one <laughs> episode. Already... Clearly, I've just given up. You have no I mean, credit. Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter's at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter's at avrant underscore Tom. Let's, our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is becoming a patron over at patreon.com. Mm -hmm. Patreon is a subscription service, so you subscribe uh, to support monthly your favorite content creators. If you choose us, you can give us a little as a dollar a month or as much as infinity dollars. So we want to thank 110 patrons over at patreon.com. We know money is going to be tight right now yep. for people, and uh, believe me, we we uh, understand that every single dollar 
is important. And uh, we thank you. But if you, you can't keep it up or you have no money to donate right now, we totally understand. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we, totally we, we certainly don't do this podcast for the money. Uh, we we ap- greatly appreciate the support. There are costs that are involved with doing the podcast. But uh, you know what? We've, we've survived this long and we will continue to survive. It's not a financial venture. So thanks so much to our 110 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast. And if you are in the situation where you're like, you know what? I'm doing all right and I'm uh, happy to give some extra money, but I only want to do it once. I don't want to do it on a recurring basis. We do have PayPal if you come to avrant.com. Over on the right-hand side, it says support avrant, and that'll take you to PayPal if you want to do that. So much thanks for all the support. And yeah. And I will say this. this If this hasn't crossed your minds, which I'm sure it has, uh, if you belong to any local gyms or you're a member of whatever, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of small businesses right now are going yeah. to absolutely go under. Uh, I've heard, you know, estimates as little as a couple of weeks before things get sort of back to normal, as much as mid-August. Uh, well, that, not even that of... might be very optimistic, depending on how things go. All right, hold on a second. Yes. All to... right. <laughs> I got to deal with this. You got to deal with that. Okay, well, while you do, I'll yeah, continue on to the news because why not? So first, I want to give a shout out to uh, Andrew L. He was the first one to alert me via Twitter. So uh, some good news. If you have an Atmos setup and you're a Disney Plus subscriber, uh, now would be a good time to check out the audio options on whatever streaming hardware you happen to be using because I have now confirmed that on LG's OLEDs via their WebOS and on the NVIDIA Shield um, that... Atmos is now working on Disney+. Plus, So it used to just be the Apple TV 4K. No longer the case. Atmos is now available on more streaming hardware for the Disney Plus service. So good news there. And yeah, they released Frozen too early because they're like, hey, you might be home. So there you go. Good news on Disney+. Plus. Uh, next news story is that WISA, the wireless audio, uh, what is it? Wireless Speaker Association? Wireless Speaker a, I think it's oh. association, whatever it is, they're adding is, yeah. Dolby Atmos support as well. That's uh, been their announcement. So existing and future WISA products will be getting Atmos support after a pending firmware update that they say is coming in quarter two, 2020. Um, so yeah. I think you can pretty much push back anything that has a date on it right Might now. be, <laughs> like... although that's software, not hardware. And the thing is, they didn't make anything explicit in the um, uh, press release that they gave out, but I do believe it's limited to seven speakers total i think it's a 5.1.2 configuration so they're just instead of surround backs some kind of height speakers because they just mentioned how you can now label something as dolby atmos height speakers and i'm like Mm. that sounds like one pair which would make sense because i don't think why especially if it's like previous existing products can get it by a firmware they were limited to seven speakers total so i think that's what that is so I, I apologize for excusing myself there. My wife called. Uh, I thought it might be an emergency. It wasn't, but it is my son's birthday oh. today, and she wanted to wish him happy birthday. So <laughs> felt like whatever I you got to do, we're over. flexible around here. So Microsoft revealed pretty much all the details except for price and exact launch date of the Xbox Series X or the XX, mm-hmm. as we're going to be calling it around Xbox here because X. that's what they want to call it. Uh, journalists were invited to see all the innards and go hands-on with the new controller. I hope nobody actually did the hands-on part, but whatever. Yeah, everybody did. Final specs include 8-core <laughs> AMD Zen 2 CPU running at 3.8 gigahertz. AMD RDNA, is that? That's just that the, a, the name that's just of it. That's say it? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know maybe if that was Randa or something like that. I was supposed to say it weird. Uh, RDNA 2 GPU running at 1.825 gigahertz with hardware ray tracing, which is apparently a thing that people want, but yet don't it's use. It's the lighting I thing. And, you know, kind of funnily, they showed it off with um, Minecraft, you know, that <laughs> graphical powerhouse. But it was because <laughs> the difference was so stark between right, the right. very basic graphics versus the graphics are still all blocky and everything, but with the ray trace lighting it, like completely changed the look. So that, that's why they demoed it that way. Eight gigs of RAM, 10 gigs dedicated to the GPU, 3.5 gigs for other purposes, 2.5 gigs dedicated to the OS, a one terabyte custom NVMe. 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 Yeah. Solid state hard drive with 2.4 gig, uh, gigabytes per second yeah. transfer gigabytes rate. Gigabytes per second transfer that's rate. That's pretty that's fast. a lot. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> no more load times. That's their goal. Well, all all those uh, all those speedrunners are going to be 
salivating to get this and lower their times because of load times going way down. So on their whatever games they do. Yep. Expansion ports for proprietary one point uh, one terabyte external SLC drive that matches the internal hard drive. So, you know, Microsoft branded probably be very affordable. Ultra <laughs> HD Blu-ray drive. Uh, all games targeted at least 4K60 with support for up to 120 uh, frames per second. Yeah. So. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out, because I noticed this when they uh, showed the official back panel. So we have an official back panel now, not a leak, not a speculation. This is what the back panel actually looks like. And I noticed right away, first of all, they've done away with the HDMI input. So that's gone. You're not going to do what you could do on an Xbox One by inputting your cable box. That's out the window. But there is one HDMI output. It is an HDMI 2.1 output with the full 48 gigabits per second. But there's one of them. And there's no optical audio output. So there is one That's... output out of this thing. And it means that if you want all the HDMI 2.1 video goodness, you know, 4K at 120 frames per second, which is something they're looking to support, well, unless you wait and get a brand new AV receiver with HDMI 2.1 ports, you can't plug it into your AV receiver first and then onto your TV and pass through 4K 120 without HDMI 2.1 on your AV receiver. So clearly the idea is you plug this directly into your TV. That would mean the only way to get audio back to your AV receiver is via eARC, right? If you want full Atmos audio, it would have to be eARC. So, I mean, some of us have AV receivers with eARC. We don't necessarily have to get an HDMI 2.1 AV receiver, but a lot of people still have an AV receiver that had regular ARC, and I guess regular ARC would still work, but then you're limited to, you know, SPDIF audio. You're limited to either two-channel stereo or 5.1 vanilla Dolby Digital or DTS. So once again, I think the audio has kind of been uh, not the priority on this device, I might For imagine. For Microsoft? I know. That Who would sounds have unusual. It? But oh. be prepared that your audio setup with an Xbox Series X uh, could be uh, not quite what you expected. It might require buying a new AV receiver if you want all the Atmos goodness. All right, some comments here. Damien heard uh, Infinite Gary asking about any screens with audio that goes... Uh, scenes. Any scenes. Yeah. Scenes. With audio that go that goes vertically. Damien suggested Iron Man 2. This, uh, this is why. <laughs> I, I haven't watched that movie it. since it came out in the theater. I saw it once. I uh, one time, I think I might have might have seen it twice. I think I, <laughs> I think I might have seen it twice, but it is a very bad movie. Uh, Damien suggests I ran to the scene at the Stark Expo where uh, Vanco hacks War Machine to chase after Iron Man. Shoots him really... up straight up vertically. Hey, hey, sounds good to me. Sounds like That's a it. perfectly plausible yeah. scene. Thank you, Damien. Appreciate that. Yeah, and now somebody has a reason to buy that movie. <laughs> if you would like to. Buy it from me. I think I own it. <laughs> I think somebody gave it to me for my birthday or something. I watched it went, ugh, and never watched it again. <laughs> Speaking of Damien, Steve uh, heard us talking about Damien's green dust blob on his Epson 5040UB and suggested that if Epson doesn't uh, just do a replacement, it is possible to have it professionally cleaned. We said that uh, last week. We said that. Uh, Steve had a very similar dust blob in his 5040UB and uh, came across an advice to try running the projector in high altitude mode. Steve ran it that way for about three hours and it was enough to dislodge and remove the dust blob in his case. I have never heard of this I'm, in my I'm ever so slightly hesitant because all, of, all it really does is kick your fan, the regular fan, the regular cooling yeah. fan into like extra high mode. Because um, high altitude mode, right. the air is thinner up there, so you're it's moving, moving the air more quickly because it's uh, yeah not conducting as much heat away. Um, so I mean, it's akin to just blowing in more air in there. Now this is the regular fan inside; it's still the air is being drawn through your regular filter. So hopefully, you aren't introducing additional dust like i said don't just blow a can of compressed air in there because that tends to just blow more dust, more dust in there yeah. as opposed to removing whatever little dust blob might already be there so i mean high altitude mode is absolutely something you might use anyway so it should be pretty safe to run if it works obviously it's not doing any harm to just give it a try so uh, that's an okay suggestion but i'm a little bit hesitant on the on like counting on it working because again it might blow more dust in there unfortunately <laughs> but you know what mm. it, it's not like you're breaking any type of warranty by using a feature that's built into the projector. So give it a yeah. try. On to the questions. Andy, a few episodes ago, Andy described a setup where he has a Marantz receiver for his 5.1.4 Atmos setup, but he also bought an Emotiva, Emotiva USP1 uh, stereo preamp to use specifically with two-channel sources and full-range listening with his tower speakers. 
I might not have been here for this podcast. Uh, they, uh, that might have been. It was either solo or with Lee, because I remember answering okay. that, but I think you were away I don't that, remember this. for that particular the question. Emotiva, that's because I don't care. Emotiva <laughs> has HG bypass inputs, so he plugged that front, left, and right pre-outs from his uh, Marantz to those, but no sound was ever coming out of his front, left, and right speakers unless he was using only the Emotiva with sources plugged directly into that preamp. Rob explains that, explained in past tense, because this is what happened before, that the Emotiva has two sets of outputs, and the ones labeled full range do not work with the HG bypass inputs at all. Yeah. To use the HG bypass, you have to use Emotiva's high pass outputs which apply analog filtering they roll rob off the base said, that's what that's right do. rob also said that if he wants to run his front left and right towers full range for his two channel sources and he could plug the pre-outs from his rants into a regular pair of inputs on the emotiva rather than using the hd bypass inputs andy would have to make sure he always sets the volume in the emotiva correctly but it should function mm -hmm. so now andy wants to know how his subwoofer should be connected basically he wants full base management with all speakers at the small and a subwoofer handling the bass when he's using his full Atmos system, but he wants to use just his Emotiva preamp and his front towers running full range when he's listening to two channel sources. But occasionally he might want to be able to use his subwoofer with one of his two channel sources. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, otherwise it would be obvious, right? Otherwise yeah, it would be yeah. you connect your subwoofer to your Marantz and that's yeah, it. Yeah, you're done. But yeah. uh, he's like, you know, sometimes I want, want to, I don't know what, maybe it's a CD or something like that as opposed to a turntable. And he's like, I actually want to use the subwoofer with just my two-channel setup. So he's like, he's basically wondering, does he take the subwoofer out feed from his Marantz and put it into the HT bypass of the Emotiva so that there's only one cable running from now the Emotiva to his subwoofer, right? Sort of a daisy chain going through the Emotiva. Or does he connect the Marantz to his subwoofer as normal? That'll obviously work for the Atmos setup. And then right. connect a second cable from the subwoofer to his Emotiva so that if he wants to use the sub with his Emotiva, there's a cable connecting those two things. Like, is that going to blow something up by having, you know, two preamps connected? Or, you know, it, does he feed it all through the Emotiva? I would say that just having two separate connections Should be okay. is, is fine. Um, but yeah. the question is, I don't know anything in the Emotiva where you can select whether that subwoofer output is active or not. Like, as far as I'm aware, that home theater bypass outputs, um, yeah, they're always active. Or the uh, the high pass and low pass outputs of the right. Emotiva. It's analog. Yeah, so they're, they're always active. So uh, you would have to, like, power off your subwoofer if you don't want to use it with the Emotiva at that point. But then it would still be... But he could still have his front left right speakers connected to the full range output. Full so range versus, the thing okay, is, you yeah, wouldn't yeah. be getting bass management from the Emotiva no matter what you're doing. Like your front left right towers would always be playing full range, and then you could augment them with the subwoofer output of the Emotiva, and then you could just tur turn the subwoofer itself off when you are using the Emotiva but don't but want the sub active. That when it in order for. <laughs> in order for him to use the subwoofer with the emotiva at the same time of course he'd be doubling up on the bass yes you know, at yeah. least the, the, the part that overlaps yeah. but he'd also have to have the volume levels on both set identical so the subwoofer isn't louder than the i know it's i don't know it, it, I have an he idea. He says How it's about complicated. Don't do this. <laughs> I know. I well, I mean, my... buy a second subwoofer. You only, he's only got five point one, anyways, right? Five point one point four, whatever. Right. Buy a second subwoofer. Connect that one to the Emotiva. Oh, I see. And, you know, and connect you know, only use that one when you're using the Emotiva, and use the other one when you're using the Marantz. That's one solution. I mean, my honest solution, and I said this last time too, was. I wouldn't bother having the Emotiva in this setup. I like know. with your Marantz, if you are really stuck on, I mean, we don't agree with the idea of turning a subwoofers off for two channel music, but you know what? You're free to do what you want with your own system. You're direct, baby. But You're yeah, direct. you just put it in direct mode. I mean, you don't even have to mess around with the separate settings for two channel versus what you just put it in direct mode. And now your front left, right towers are going to play full range and your subwoofer is going to turn off. You put it in stereo mode. Uh, you know, stereo listening mode, and now your front left right speakers will be set to small, and your subwoofer will be active again. So just with a listening mode switch on your Marantz from direct to stereo, you can achieve what you want, but he's got it in mind that somehow the Emotiva sounds better. I don't particularly know why. So, um, I mean, it is complicated. He's like, can we sort out the complication of this? Like, 
not really. I mean, no. first of all, I, <laughs> what I can simplify here for him is I would not be taking the subwoofer output of the Marantz and feeding that into the Emotiva. I don't see how that There's no you, reason really. to do that. Uh, it, you know, if you're worried about like, oh, I've got two plugs coming from different sources into one subwoofer, that's fine. I mean, if you had the front left and right pre-outs going into your mm -hmm. subwoofer and there's only bass in the front left channel, it's not as though that somehow like goes back down the cable into the front right channel and blows something right. up. No, that, do that doesn't happen. Yeah. So it's totally fine to have two separate preamps connected to one subwoofer if that's the issue. Um, it's, but slow, it's slow voltage anyway. So, I oh, mean, yeah. It's not like you're connecting two amps to the that's same right. speaker. Yeah, it's not an know? amp amplified signal going to one speaker but the whole thing of is the subwoofer going to be level matched for both the Marantz and the Emotiva on its own volume dial is turning the subwoofer itself on and off depending on whether you want to use it with the Emotiva or not is having the bass doubled up because your front towers are still running full range and not having their bass rolled off by the Emotiva like that's a whole bunch of things that Either you do what Tom says and you simply get another subwoofer, a second subwoofer that's dedicated just to the Emotiva, or maybe we just kind of forget this idea. And you can greatly simplify the thing by just your front left right towers run full range when it's two channel time, and the Marantz is just feeding into a just regular to, input you know, on the Emotiva instead of the home so theater bypass. Go up there, you know, have your wife or significant other or whomever, <laughs> you know, switch it from. The Marantz full, you know, Marantz doing just running bypass. in direct mode. Yeah. Or, you know, the direct mode and then the Emotiva mm -hmm. and kind of go back and forth without you knowing which one is which and see if you can pick out the Emotiva without looking at, right. at the lights, you know, to see what's what's on and what's not on. If you can't pick it out, well, if you can't pick it out, it's a vol it's either a volume difference or something's being EQ'd someplace. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are the two options. The Marantz in direct or pure direct mode, that's turned off Odyssey. It's running the yeah. front left right's full range. There's no difference from what the Emotiva is doing at that point. Yeah. Davide in Italy. First up, Davide in Italy can't go out of his house, I don't think, legally yeah. right now. So Country is on lockdown. Lockdown. So sorry, guys, uh, all of my Italian listeners and friends and family, though I don't know that I have anybody that lives there right now, but I have in the past. So uh, hang tight, guy. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully you're doing OK there. But he wants to say thanks a lot for answering his previous questions regarding his big renovation for his villa in Tuscany and also Grazie for pronouncing his name at least somewhat correctly. I'll take somewhat. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> My French foreign exchange student who's about to go back to France uh, because wouldn't you want to go home in a situation like this? Uh, always makes fun of my pronunciation of French words. So usually people just say David and don't even try. He agrees with our pragmatic advice uh, for his sound system and he thinks that sticking with a 5.2 setup makes the most sense by buy 7.2.4 Atmos. Yay. So he appreciate the suggestion for an angled cornered setup but he would prefer to keep everything perpendicular and parallel so we'd like to put the large TV on the left wall beside the, uh, do we have the pictures? Okay. Yep, just below. Uh, the left wall beside the dining area and he would like to just have a large TV stand that can hold all of his home theater gear as well as the center speaker. The TV stand has not been selected and it could even be custom built, so its exact size is flexible and the flat sectional sofa with the long weighted pillows for backrest can be configured to, for any reasonable shape, so there's some flexibility there as well. So what do we think of this propo proposed front speaker setup? Now, to so he's got it in the corner. Explain a little bit, yeah, yeah. He's got yeah. his TV on the wall, and I'm totally fine with that. We it yeah, yeah. does not That's have right. to be a diagonal corner placement. It was just an idea that might have worked, uh, but totally fine with keeping it flat on the wall. But he's put his front left speaker all the way in the front left corner, and his front right speaker on the other side of the doorway. So the front left and right speakers are very wide apart, um, and that front right speaker is like extra far away it's like into the dining area instead of on the tv i don't think they need to be wide apart that wide apart uh, i think you might have well, overestimated the size of the tv on that wall yeah I, I, yeah. yeah i think so too you can maybe get them everything closer together but yeah. maybe he's measured it maybe maybe he maybe hasn't. but uh, I, I, yeah. I i i would i would have your front right speaker um, you know, on the same side of the doorway as your TV. I wouldn't have it on the opposite side of the doorway. And I think your front left speaker doesn't have to be right into the corner of the room. I think it can also yeah. be a, a bit closer to the TV. But other than that, I think the, the rest of the plan sounds totally fine. Looks good to me. Yeah. Uh, did I have to read anything there? Okay. Uh, uh, the Yamo speakers that he already owns are actually in a white finish, so he can't justify switching to Kef speakers on looks alone. Mm -hmm. The R-series also be quite a bit more expensive than he's really considering. So 
uh, he would be looking at the Kep Q series if you were to buy new speakers. Those are still available in gloss white finish. So purely on sound quality alone and not looks, would it make sense to switch from the Yamo S80 series to the Kep Q series? I don't think so, especially if they're already white. I'm kind of saying stick with the Yamos. Yeah, that's that's tough to justify. Now, one consideration for him is that as far as his surround speakers go, he's probably going to have to buy something because he was previously using tower fronts and tower surrounds, and he doesn't want tower surrounds anymore. Totally fine okay. with that. So he's buying yeah. at least one pair of speakers. Um, but, I mean, I can't justify to you that going to the KefQ series is like inherently such a huge sound quality upgrade over your Yamo yeah. speakers. I mean, if you... A, B, compare them in this room. Like, don't just do it at a showroom because a showroom doesn't look like your room in this That's villa. Sure. It, that, that is not going to be similar acoustics in whatever the showroom is. So if you compare your Yamos and some Kef Q series in this room and you're like, I vastly prefer the Kefs, well, hey, absolutely. But there's nothing inherently about the sound quality where I'd be like, oh yeah, it's totally going to be worth it. So I at least give the Yamos a try. Bring in a pair of bookshelf kefs from a local dealer and audition them in your room and and that's really the only way to tell in my opinion so you didn't want any surround speakers on stands next to the center central fireplace but he is willing to consider in wall surrounds one of them would go above the large opening and that would end up being the left surround the right surround could be installed in the central column for the fireplace mm. Are you sure about that? I mean, that <laughs> column to be exists because I think there's a vent going up through your roof yeah, line. Yeah. I don't know about that one. I don't one. know what's I in that wall. I feel like that's yeah. not going to be something that you could do. Yeah. Um, I think your best bet is on walls or uh, on a shelf. Yes. Speakers. Yeah. 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 I'm much more in favor of doing an on wall, something mounted on the wall. Now, they're going to be up quite high. Um, yeah. So that it's not like they're going to be blocking a walkway whatsoever. If you were to go with Kef, and I actually think Yamo has some speakers that are similar to this now. They're basically the wedge shape. They're the type that could either be used upward firing or they can oh, be okay. mounted on a wall and they just have a nice little angle aiming them down a little bit. Those to me are ideal in this situation because they're very easy to wall mount. Yours are going to be up high. So the angle down makes sense and they're up and out of the way. They're going to be in a nice white finish. I, I, I don't think I would go for in wall here because I'm concerned about what's behind that fireplace flume. Yeah. Yeah. I like on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, would they need to be angled towards the seats, or or could he just could they just be installed flush to the walls? And should the heights match? He doesn't really have much of an option for the left surround because uh, it's above the opening, but the right surround of the fire or on the fireplace column, mm -hmm. if we're right, could be lower. What would be best? I mean, aesthetically, I would always try to get them to match. Oh yeah, heights. I would match their heights uh, for sure. Yeah. So, and then angled towards you, I mean, it depends on how far away the seat is, but it looks like it's kind of quite far back. Uh, yeah. the, the speakers are quite far back. So, I mean, it's it, not it, it depends. insanely far back from the seats. Yeah. So I, I don't think I would like tow them forward, but I would yeah. absolutely go for it. Just what I mentioned, the, the ones that have a built are in angle. Already. So they're going to be facing down a little bit which totally makes sense because yours are going to be up quite high uh so they'll be facing down a little bit but i wouldn't bother towing them forward or anything because they're they're surrounds they're supposed to be diffuse sounding anyway so the svs subwoofers are available in italy so yeah but the only one available in the white finish right now is sb1000 that would be far too small correct Yes. Oh yeah! Don't yeah! Don't do don't don't do that! Don't, don't do that! So the PC four thousand cylinders would be over the budget he's hoping to use. So, do we think? What do we think about a dual PC two thousand Pro cylinder subs? Tom said they could just be covered with fabric, correct? That doesn't impact their sound or vibrations in any way. Well, it depends on if you what fabric you put over the top of them. <laughs> I mean, you throw carpet over the top of them, yes. <laughs> it, it'll, but something that is line the uh, actual driver and stuff carpet into the port. Okay, that would yeah, affect it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> acoustically transparent fabric sure. of any kind so how do you know it's acoustically transparent be i guess you can't do this right now mm. but you you would generally we, we would say take it put it up to your face breathe through it if you feel resistance as you're breathing through it it's not acoustically transparent yeah uh clearly that's not something you want to do right now so just search online for acoustically transparent fabric and buy that bring a little fan and just put it there and 
feel if it blows through without too much resistance right. going through the fabric. But uh, yeah, I mean, you yeah. can't leave the house, dude. He's not going anywhere. Uh, any uh, any nice fabric that, uh, as far as the looks go, yeah, uh, draping that over a cylinder sub is really no problem. But all the de- the drivers firing downward, and you sure can't miss the port on a PC two thousand Pro. You're you're gonna yeah. notice where the port. My God, that is a huge port on those things. Um, I mean, are they sufficient in themselves for this enormous room size? No. Uh, yep. You're not going to be fully pressurizing at 20 hertz with dual PC 2000 Pros, but we love that SVS is the they're so well protected that you could literally have the volume dial on those turned all the way up if that's where Odyssey tells you to put it, and you will still be okay. So I like that choice. Uh, the form factor certainly makes sense to me, and yeah, I'm good with that choice. So he says this is a full renovation, so running the speaker wire inside the walls is no problem. He just needs to be sure of locations. Any final words on speaker and subwoofer placement so he can plan out the wiring? Uh, So the subwoofers he's planning on putting, it looks like... uh, Yeah, like rear right corner of this seating area, which is beside the kitchen, for one. Can we just not get two and get one bigger one? Can we get one 4,000? I mean, I, 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 I mean... I don't know if I'm in favor of that. Well, whatever. (laughs) Having two, I don't, I mean, I I would almost co-locate them just to get more output, but it's not (laughs) going to be that much more output anyways, so, Um, you know. I mean, if if he's okay with the placement that he's proposed, I don't have a big problem with it because in this space, this is not at all a rectangle where the ceiling line is crazy. We're not going to have, you know, normal, predictable uh, sound waves in here. So uh, I've got no problem with the what he's proposed. However, um, I do actually think that in what is the front left corner of this theater setup, instead of the front left speaker being bang in that corner i think you will be able to move it closer to the side of the tv opening up that corner space i think a cylinder will probably be able to fit in your front left corner so i mean this is absolutely not diagonally opposite corner placement it is of the quote-unquote theater area but not of the room whatsoever i don't i don't so the the front left well the front the uh there's one subwoofer that's behind the seating area to Mm -hmm. like what would be the right right rightish corner and there's one that's like just in front of the opening on the left wall Mm -hmm. there and that i think is going to be not a good place for it (laughs) yeah i I think it's just cylinder is easier to deal with if that's where it goes but um i I think yeah yeah front left corner of the theater area as a whole i think it'll honestly it's it's coaxial cable that goes on the wall it's pennies on the foot so uh you could wire both you could wire both yeah and then have two options there that's what i would do that's it. Chris. Chris says, thanks for recommending the 27-inch Samsung CHG70 monitor for his bedroom setup. He actually likes the idea of a slight curve since he's so close to the display. And Tom is correct that the resolution doesn't really matter much. So Chris, since Chris is visually impaired, but he can definitely see the difference with HDR. So that is really what he's after. All which right. is fantastic. That's yeah. good to know. I did not know that. I was just at uh, somebody's house uh, recently and their daughter is deaf, but she learned to read lips and mm-hmm. speak just on her own <laughs> she she just, they didn't know she was deaf until she was like seven or something oh, like that it was wow. ridiculous <laughs> and she doesn't you know people who are deaf sometimes they have a, a funny accent sure you know because it, they, they've never heard but she doesn't she speaks wow it's insane yeah. so she's not like a hundred percent deaf but she's mm. she can hear my voice better because it's lower mm-hmm. but it was the same sort of thing it's very interesting i like to ask questions about people like this so i get a better idea of you know what they're experiencing because she does she likes to sing she likes to uh she likes to listen to music but she can't she only hear parts of it right. and all of that so anyways uh blah, blah, blah. of course the samsung does not do dolby vision not that there are really any better options but should he worry at all about not having dolby vision since he's mostly using an apple tv 4k as a source uh no <laughs> really no i mean no. find finding computer monitors that do dolby vision there are a few uh, yeah. but um, not in the sort of price range that you were considering. And no, I, I I wouldn't worry about it at all. I mean, like you say, I don't have a better recommendation as far as this computer monitor goes for you anyway, especially right. not the, the sort of price range that you were hoping to hit. Um, but no, I mean, HDR10 coming out of your Apple TV 4K, which is what it will do, uh, looks pretty perfectly fine on this display most things are still mastered to a thousand nits the uh, monitor is set up to tone map 1000 nit um 
stuff correctly. Stuff that has content over 1,000 nits might just get clipped off, but you know what? You'll never know you're missing it unless you put a display beside it that actually shows you that detail. So do not fret over that, and there's not really an alternative anyway. Right. Hey, uh, Bill. Is that right? Are we going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bill. Bill's theater, theater room used to have super dark brown walls and a red ceiling. Mm -hmm. Red. His wife hated this dungeon look, so he repainted the room light gray with a white ceiling. Yay. I like it much better. It definitely does look better. His wife loves the new look, so there's no going back now. He's using an Epson 5040 UB with a 110-inch acoustically transparent screen. He doesn't actually know the brand since the screen came with the house when they bought it, but it's just plain white. The impact on his picture quality has been a lot worse than he expected for kids' shows. They typically have the lights on. They... This, they obviously don't didn't look great before, but now they're completely unwatchable because they're so washed out. With the lights off for movies, the contrast is very clearly worse now, and the image doesn't look as bright as it used to either. There's now an obvious reflection of light on the overhead soft uh, light on the overhead soffit, mm -hmm. but covering even that section or repainting it is a total no go. He had wanted to upgrade his screen size anyways, but the screen has to remain acoustically transparent. Is there any screen we can suggest that will help? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Well, we obviously don't know what screen this is. We Just by looking at it, it's just a white screen. You can't tell. Just white, but acoustically transparent, clearly, because uh, his speakers are definitely behind where the behind screen it. goes. So, uh, yeah. so there's a, first of all, and I'm sure Rob has already gone through this with him, but, you know, a lot of times when you change something this drastically in your room, uh, there's going to be some differences in your in just everything, you know, it's the same thing as when you add acoustic treatments or anything like that. You know, it takes some recalibration not only of maybe your equipment, but also your brain. So, you know, you, you may not have gotten the reflection off the ceiling that you got before, but you were probably getting some sort of red reflection off that ceiling mm -hmm. uh, or something along those lines that were that was affecting how your picture looked. And now that it's not doing that any longer, you know, you're perceiving something as being different, as being bad. That may not be the case. Probably is the case that, you know, what you're experiencing is negative. Yeah. Uh, but there's, a you know, it's not out out of the question that you should be looking at your projector to adjust the brightness levels, the, you know, the contrast, some of these other things because of what's going on, uh, in your room. Uh, does that mean that you shouldn't upgrade your screen? Absolutely not. But, you know, let's look at your actual equipment and make sure that all of our settings are set correctly before we, you know, just go and see if we can get a light rejecting acoustically transparent screen that'll, you know, hotspot and everything else. So yeah, in this case, though, I mean, this can be really significant because it, it's yeah. not it's not just that your walls are now uh, reflecting additional light back onto the screen. It's that the room in general, because I assume he didn't replace all of his lights. The right. room in general is genuinely brighter now right. because previously you just didn't have as much reflection of light going on. I mean, those, those walls were almost black. They were really, really, really dark brown. And in the image, the some of the ceiling is already white because this was taken mid-painting already. But, you know, it used to be like a flat red. It wasn't reflecting light. I, I You know, his description of what the cartoons look like now with the kids shows tells the story. Like it, it went right. from, well, this doesn't look great with the lights on, but now it's like, I can't see anything, <laughs> like barely anything. So unfortunately, I mean, an, an ambient light rejecting screen is what you need in this case. You need a good one, not just gray with gain. Those can look half decent in some situations, but you need proper. But more than that, to get one that can be acoustically transparent as well, your solutions are very, very limited. I really only know of one, and that is Alune Visions. Uh, they do offer their Aurora 4K ambient light rejecting screen uh, as a perforated acoustically transparent model. Mm. It's the only one I know of that's a true ambient light rejecting with acoustical transparency. I, I'm not aware. Well, that's not true. There's what, like uh, Stuart or uh, Screen Innovations, but those are getting into tens of thousands of dollars now. Loon Visions in the size you're thinking of is going to be around $2,400. That's about the same price as what you paid for your projector. It's expensive, but... I don't have a better solution that, like I say, the only other ones that do the same thing are like into the ten thousand dollar range. Right. So and it's, it's just, crazy. At this point, you should start thinking of uh, how you use things and whether or not it's worth going through this extra expense. <laughs> because if you're going to spend twenty four hundred dollars on a light rejecting screen, right, it doesn't make sense, honestly, to ever watch it in any other context other than with lights on. I mean, that for that amount of well, money... Well, it'll still look better with the lights off, too, in this situation. Right. Where he's getting washout. It'll, it'll prevent a good amount of washout. 
So, I mean, but you may end up with, I mean, and I don't know because I've never actually viewed this screen in a darkened mm -hmm. room. You know, you may get a little bit of hot spotting depending on where you're sitting. And, you know, if you're off, if you sit off axis and that sort of thing, you may run into some issues as well. So if that's the case, you know, you know, $2,400 for a light rejecting screen, you know, how much does it cost to get a fairly large, uh, uh, you know, direct view television mm. that's not going to be this size not going to be this size but then he'd have to move his speakers too because well, he no, certainly I, can't I, put a what i'm saying is that if he's watching it with the lights off all the time you know for, yeah. for movies and then he just for the kids shows he wants to just he wants to have the lights on and everything else for this casual viewing well casual viewing is just the tv and that's what it is oh, you like know, maybe a, a sound bar at a different position in the room different position in the room mm. yeah you know, Maybe. as an option. I mean, for twenty four hundred dollars, you yeah, I would consider true. everything. Yeah. Before you know, just saying, oh, I, I just need a new, bigger, wonderful screen. Yeah, because there, there, is, there just isn't a cheap solution that is no. good in ambient light and acoustically transparent. I mean, there are the elite screens. That, you know, they got their Cinegre three D, their Cinegre five D. I'm not a huge fan of them because, like, the reason I like the Illume Vision Aurora and think it's actually worth this two thousand dollar price point is because of all the ambient light rejecting screens that are somewhat reasonably affordable. It doesn't hotspot too badly. It's like the least hot spotting that I've ever come across. The Cinegre 3D and the Cinegray 5D from Elite. Like, there's no question, if you got full sunlight, they look better than a white screen. I will absolutely tell you that. I completely agree. But in the dark, they do hotspot. There's no getting around it. They do hotspot. Mm. And some people are going to be like, look, for what it gives me with sunlight coming in, I can live with that because a white screen is completely unwatchable. So that's a compromise right. I'm willing to make. But if you're like Tom and you hate hotspotting as much as you do, then you're going to be like, man, I'd rather just find a way to black out my room and not have to deal with you know, sunlight and hot spotting. So, you know, Cinegray 3D and 5D exist, but they don't come in acoustically transparent. So the, the Loon Vision is the best I got for you. Christian. Christian says, what does it actually mean when a computer monitor is listed having a backlight that is LED with quantum dots? Is that just the same as an LED display or does it actually mean anything in terms of how good the monitor looks? The quantum dot thing. It's got to be a Samsung, right? Isn't that Samsung the only one that does quantum oh, no, dots? Oh, uh, TCL so? does quantum dots. Hisense oh, do does quantum dots. Yep. Yeah, I, mean, well. sh I mean, that's the new hotness is the quantum <laughs> dots, but I don't know that it necessarily is indicative of any sort of quality. No, it doesn't tell you about quality. Um, so chances are that... Uh, so let's explain what it is, right? We used to have... Uh, so we've got LCD displays. That's the actual thing that... Uh, uh, modulates how much light is is uh, coming out of the screen. There's a backlight of some sort, and that is shining through an LCD uh, screen. And the LCDs act like little shutters. They can open or close and modulate how much light of that backlight makes its way through. And we have three little LCDs for each pixel. We have three subpixels, one for red, one for green, one for blue, with little filters in them. So the backlight is white. That's what's coming through there. We have a white backlight. Now, we used to have like uh, fluorescent tubes back there, and then we switched over to LEDs. And the LEDs were typically actually a blue LED, and then they would shine that through a yellow phosphor, and blue going through yellow would combine into white light. And that was your quote-unquote LED display. It was still an LCD television, but it had an LED backlight now. Well, instead of using a blue LED with a yellow phosphor, now they're still using a blue LED, but shining it through quantum dots, which are little nanoparticles that will absorb the high frequency blue light and turn it into a lower frequency of light like green and or red. So now we have blue LED light beginning. It's going through a layer of quantum dots, some red quantum dots and some green quantum dots. And all of that combines into white light. <laughs> now, the advantage is that the if you were to look at a spectral graph of like what colors of light exactly are coming from that backlight you'd have a spike at blue a spike at green and a spike at red which means mm. you don't have to filter as much of the light when it was blue going through a yellow phosphor it was like a, a you know more of a hump in the middle there you didn't have nice clean spikes of green mm. and red so you had to filter out more of the light you were losing efficiency that way and you didn't get as pinpoint wide colors on the color graph if you're trying to create dcip3 color you want nice thin little points of red green and blue so quantum dots allow us to do that but it's still just a backlight shining through an lcd panel 
So some quantum dot backlights are better than others. Some are wider than others. Some are brighter than others. Some are more pinpoint than others. It doesn't tell you how good the monitor is, but it's how they're creating that backlight. That's really all it's telling you. It's now using quantum dots instead of a yellow phosphor at a blue LED in either case. Francis from Facebook. Francis asks us for suggestions for speakers with some style to replace his BMW M1 satellites. Rob suggested, suggested the Aperion Novus speakers. But we also spent some time talking about KEF speakers since Francis already has some KEF satellites and his uh, as his Atmos speakers. He ended up buying the KEF Q series, which looked fairly compact on the website photos, but they don't put anything there for reference, so <laughs> they're not. What looks small ain't small. And that's the same way I felt about the birds when I got them, too. It's like, holy crap, these things are so mm. ginormous. So the size difference between this new center, his old center and his new center speaker really tells a difference. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, pretty massive. I mean, his old one was like the size of one of the woofers in his new yeah. Kef center. And he's, there's three of those woofers in his new Kef center. So, yes, yeah. it is much, much larger. Yeah. Uh, since he has sizable bookshelf speakers as surrounds now, what do we recommend for securing them to some speaker stands so they can't fall off? Well, can't fall off? There are. <laughs> <laughs> try hard enough, you can get anything off. I, I mean, suppose, yes. Yeah. Even if you so, bolted I mean, them are, on there. There are stands that have, uh, uh, you know, sort of brackets to secure mm. the speaker, like clamps. Mm. Uh, most of the time, I find if your stand is secure, if your stand is fairly, you know, compact, then all you really need is a little bit of that uh, museum putty or something yeah. like that to kind of stick it down. And that's all it takes to keep it from, you know, getting nudged off. Yep. But uh, other than that, I mean, I don't, I don't really think you need much else. No, no. Blue tack or museum putty. That's absolutely what I would recommend. I love recommending it for securing speakers to a surface because not only does it give you something that adheres them, but it also remains pliable. So it acts as some damping as well, which mm -hmm. I love to have. I always love to have some damping between the surface of the speaker and the bottom of the bookshelf speaker. So yeah, museum putty is absolutely what I go for here or just blue tack if you're at the hardware store. Gib. Gib got a Sony A9F OLED. He's using it in a small dark room. Out of the box, the overall brightness of the screen fluctuated like crazy. So he copied the settings listed at Rutens. <laughs> Rutens. Ratings. Yeah, they whatever. just want you to say ratings, but they well, could have put gonna. an A in there if they wanted us to do that. And they uh, that seemed to calm things down. Are there any specific changes to those things that we would recommend, though? Uh, I don't know the settings. The one that usually gets you on the change the screen brightness it's the where it senses what's going on in the room right right that's the one that probably was was really hosing you there definitely and artings did a good job in their settings of getting you to turn off all of the weird automatic stuff that right. tries to change your picture mode or change your backlight setting or in this case this is an oled the oled light setting um or actually <laughs> sony confusingly now has, so you remember we used to have the brightness setting, but what brightness yeah. actually adjusted was your video black level. That's what brightness actually adjusted was video black. So Sony has now relabeled what used to be called brightness as black level. That's okay. That's really what it is. It is adjusting sure. the black level. But they have now repurposed the term brightness to mean what LG calls the OLED light setting or what is akin to the backlight setting in <laughs> an LCD TV. That's it. Sony is now calling that brightness, which is a proper descriptor, but yes, very confusing since we used to already have a setting called brightness, which they have now relabeled as black level. So anyway, uh, Artings did a pretty darn good job of getting all of the most important stuff done. And I wouldn't really say that any of their settings are wrong. There's nothing in there that I would say that you absolutely must change. Now, I will point you over to Vincent Tio's run through uh, on his HDTV test channel on YouTube, his run through of the settings for a Sony uh, A9F or AF9 as it's called over in Europe and Asia where he's doing his reviews. Um, that's just another set that you could look through. But basically, the couple of things that you might want to change, you don't have to change these, but you might want to. The gamma setting that ratings always goes for, they always target a gamma of 2.2, which if you have some ambient light and you're mostly watching TV, absolutely stick with that. But if you're mostly watching movies and mostly in a really dark room or a pitch black room, then you might want a numerically higher gamma, which actually makes most of the image look a little bit darker. That's how gamma works. Uh, so if you increase the gamma setting to a one or a two, that might 
look a little bit better if you're in a really dark room. Uh, the smooth gradation feature, they said to turn it off, which is technically correct. It means you're not futzing with the image at all. But I will say Sony's smooth gradation is the best of the consumer TV brands. Uh, it, it removes basically no detail. But if you are like if you're watching Amazon Prime or something and you're noticing some color banding, it actually works pretty well without reducing details. So I don't have a problem turning smooth gradation on for Sony televisions. Uh, the other one is Cinemotion. Um, it used to be good because they used to give you levels, but now it's right. a binary. I'm hearing something from my children. I have okay. to figure out what's going on out there. You no worries. Keep, keep I'll going. keep going. So, uh, yeah, Cinemotion in Sony TVs, they used to give you levels, and it used to be pretty good. Uh, but now it's either binary. It's on or off. So better to leave that off. Uh, and the other one is Sony OLEDs tend to look a little darker than they actually should when it comes to Dolby Vision. So if you're in a pitch black room, the Dolby Vision dark setting is still technically correct, but you'll probably want to try using the Dolby Vision bright picture mode most of the time uh, on a Sony TV. So it, those are just things to try. Nothing in ratings was actually what I would say was wrong or had to be changed, uh, but those are a few things. Gamma, smooth gradation, Cinemotion, turn it off, and try Dolby Vision bright if it's like, eh, it looks a little bit murky. Let's uh, move on to Nick B here. Nick still has a CR or still had a CRT in his living room, but it finally broke. So uh, Nick almost never uses that TV himself, but his wife and his kids do. So he's decided to go with a TCL 6 Series. He actually went with the 2018 615. You can still grab those. So that's what he got to replace his old CRT. He'd like to have an Ultra HD Blu-ray player attached to this new TV, but we already went over how now, um, Panasonic's UB450 that we really like because it has like all the HDR modes. Um, we, we like that one, but it's not available in North America. Um, and then the UB420 doesn't do Dolby Vision. And this new TCL 6 series does. So there's no way he's going to pay $500 and get a UB820 for this living room TV. Uh, so he's just like, the TCL does Dolby Vision. The Sony players technically do Dolby Vision. He's aware that you have to manually switch Dolby Vision on and off. The Sony players don't automatically detect it, which is the dumbest thing ever. Um, but he's like, his wife and kids are never going to bother changing it. But he would if he's ever in there. So what do we think? What players should he get to just get a Sony study on Dolby Vision? Um... I mean, honestly, it doesn't really matter because either the Sony or the UB420 is going to cost the same in this case. I don't think Dolby Vision is a big enough thing that I would be like, oh, you have to get the Sony over the Panasonic in this case. I might even say that since the TCL doesn't do frame by frame analysis of HDR, um, you know, it just has one set tone mapping for HDR10 and then it does have Dolby Vision that like I might rather have the UB420's um, HDR optimizer. And just don't worry about Dolby Vision because um, I, I think that's probably the better way to go. They cost the same, so I'd probably go 420 in this case. <laughs> does want the option for a bigger screen. Uh, so we'll add the projector when funds allow, and he's strongly leaning towards the JVC. Everyone's strongly leaning towards the JVC. It's just your pocketbook Your that doesn't always take it but right. <laughs> doesn't always get you there uh both the lg oled and the jvc projector do frame by frame hdr tone mapping correct so is the panasonic hdr optimizer of any value with any either of these displays i mean of any value i mean probably not yeah you, you don't know. really need it you i don't, don't really see it you don't see really need why it. i mean i'm sure there is a use case that somebody can point out oh with this specific disc <laughs> right yeah the, it retains you know, slightly it, more detail yeah, by yeah. both hdr optimizer and frame by frame combo or something sure yeah, yeah i'm sure that's yeah. a, just like how sometimes you compare the what the frame by frame did versus dolby vision it's like yeah there's a there's a slight difference in this one little highlight over here like it's really small little differences but um Nah, largely, I wouldn't say you absolutely need it. Not not in this case. For displays that don't have frame-by-frame, frame, it's much more valuable, but both of yours right. would. 
So he would definitely consider a Panasonic like the UB820 for this room, but he actually likes to have a region-free D- player for DVD and Blu-rays, and mm-hmm. he just got his region-free OPPO BDP83 Blu-ray player repaired for that purpose. On a side note, he says, how amazing is that OPPO is still supporting their Blu-ray player? Yeah. It's good on them. Yeah. I, color me shocked. <laughs> but he also tracked down a seller who's offering a region-free Panasonic UB450 units in North America. Even with the modification and import costs, it's still under $500, so it's cheaper than the UB820. Mm-hmm. And it would give him another region-free player as a backup. It just doesn't have the HDR optimizer, so what do we think? I don't need to get that. That sounds great. I'd like that. That's yeah, fine. it sounds good. I mean, I'm betting this isn't the type of seller where you could return it or have it repaired if something right. goes wrong <laughs> you know this this isn't like a uh, an authorized uh you know fully backed type of thing you probably don't have a manufacturer's warranty anymore because i'm sure this is a non-authorized modification that's being done mm-hmm. to the thing um so i mean if you're okay with all of that you know <laughs> like the HDR optimizer is not the thing that I'm going to tell you is is make or break in this case. Absolutely not. Um, so yeah, given that it will do, you know, Dolby Vision for your OLED, um, it could even do HDR 10 plus if you ever get a display that does that. You don't really need the HDR optimizer, and you can get it for less money and have it be region free as long as you're willing for the risk of not having a manufacturer's warranty anymore. Uh, yeah, I- I'm good with that. I'd say it's between that or the 820. It's going to be one or the other. Shall I carry on as you text? No, I am. uh, Text is done. (laughs) He'll have the 77-inch OLED for lights on and smaller content like regular HGTV. Then he'll have his projector for the movies, but he's absolutely enamored with the idea of having both the 2.35 to 1 and a huge 16 by 9, same width but taller options. And he is 100% certain he would set up whatever harmony sequences are necessary to switch back and forth. All right. He got excited. Okay. He got excited when he (laughs) saw that Elite Screens offers their VMAX dual screen with a 120-inch 16 by 9 and 114 inch 2.35 to 1 in a single case. These are exactly the sizes that he wants, and it would all be motorized so he can switch back and forth at the press of a button at, at all at a price he can afford. Mm-hmm. But as far as shopping for that screen online, those sizes are only available with the acoustically transparent fabric, and he'll be sitting eight and a half feet away, so he doesn't want or need acoustically transparent. Uh, it's also not t- the tab tension version that he would strongly prefer. So do we know of any other option? He will be going to the extreme in this dedicated theater when it comes to blacking everything out. So even with a JVC, he's pretty certain he wants masking when he's watching 2.35 to 1 content. Even the darkest gray won't do. Those bars have to be black, so what can he do? Uh, it sounds like you can buy this one screen that you really like, or you can buy two separate screens. I mean, those are pretty much your options. Uh, if you don't. Well, I, 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 I got to tell you here, I what you really want is a Seymour AV screen. Yeah, that that's that, that is it. really what you want because look, even if you're saying I'm going to have a 2.35 to 1 and a 16 by 9 screen, same width, so I I that's the, my preference because then if you're watching IMAX or something with subtitles, you've got the same width but the screen got even taller for IMAX or to include the subtitles. But what you really want because you're like I want these black bars to be perfect. That means you need variable masks because not all CinemaScope is exactly 2.35 to 1. Some are 2.39, right. some are 2.30. Like there's yes. all kinds of different. You want the ability to adjust. So what you really need is Seymour's um, motorized screen because it's absolutely tab tension. They don't have any option but tab tension. And then you don't have to get it with their acoustically transparent f- fabric. Seymour will make you with any of their fabrics, including their matte white, which is completely textureless and perfect in that sense. And then they have, instead of two screens, they have your motorized screen, which will be your big 16 by 9 size, and then a motorized masking that comes down from the top. But what you'll want to do is not get their binary masking down or up. You want to get their variable motor that so that you can... Could... This all yeah, sounds it's, very expensive. It's more, but I mean, that if you're going to do this, do it right. I mean, he's talking about getting a JVC projector, going to the extreme of completely blacking out his room. I'm like, right. why do you then do a half measure on your screen? That doesn't yeah. make sense to me. Like, do go whole hog here. Because, I mean, the Seymour one is not so expensive that it's outlandish. That mm. That's the thing here. Because the thing is... You can talk to Elite. Elite will make you a custom screen. It's not that they can't do a custom screen. So this is what they, you know, have in their online storefront. It's not exactly what you want, but they can make you the screen that you want. But he was looking at the non-tab tension version. The tab tension version is significantly more expensive. Mm -hmm. This would be a custom, so it wouldn't be the same 
mass market price. There'd be a upcharge for that. Once you include all of that, you're getting pretty close to what the Seymour screen costs anyway. And with the Elite, you don't have variable height masking. You have one or the other. Right. So I'm telling you that this is get what you really want. Don't don't do a half measure at this point. That doesn't make sense to me. Mm. I think that doesn't make sense to me. Is sitting eight and a half feet away from a 120 inch screen. <laughs> <laughs> that just sounds I mean, sounds painful. If you that want sounds, full IMAX immersion, then that's that. That's, yeah, that's that sounds it. like in order to see what's happening in the, the front left, you'll have to <laughs> look up left. So, Joe. Joe just upgraded uh, his pre-pro from a Marantz uh, AV7702 Mark II to the flagship uh, AV8805. Mm-hmm. He already owned a two seven-channel amplifier, so he's gone ahead and configured for a full 9.1.4 setup. He's looking forward to experimenting with the Odyssey Editor app, and since it's already included, he'd be happy to give Oro 3D a try, too. Obviously, Rob has talked about front-wide speakers on several occasions, and Joe also felt encouraged to give them a try when he heard Anthony Grimaldi. Is that right? <laughs> Grimani. Germania, I think there's no L in there, talking about them on the Home Theater Geeks podcast a while back. The idea of filling in the gap between the front speakers and the side surrounds made sense to Joe. He's got a – there's not really that much of a gap, but whatever. <laughs> uh, he got his pair uh, his pair of THX certified Sonant spe- cinema speakers positioned at 50 degrees to either side of the center, and he has recal- uh, relabeled his top – front and top rear speakers as front heights and front and rear heights since he wants a configuration that's compatible with all of the immersive audio formats. So that's where we're at as of this moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. What demo material would Rob recommend for listening to his new front right wide speakers? Ah, that's always fun. Uh, first of all, I am stricter than even Dolby or DTS when it comes to where your front wide speakers should go. Um, they gotta be at 60 degrees, man. Like I, I, in my opinion, there's no wiggle room. I've, I've tried it. I've tried it out and I'm like to do what they're really meant to do. They gotta be at 60 degrees and nothing, but that's, that's where they gotta go. Um, so I don't know. Obviously he chose where they are for some kind of reason, but that if it, even if it means bringing them in and like forward on stands, like they got to be at 60 degrees to really do their job. Uh, let's see what sounds really good. Uh, dread is probably one of the best as far okay. as front wide demo material. Uh, the first Avengers movie, uh, that whole battle with New York, there's a lot going right. around Okay, and, and full circular pans. Those are good. Um, John wick, all the John wicks are really good at those mixes that actually put sounds into your front wides. So I think those are, those are good demos. Okay. Yeah. Obviously most content is actually coded to use front wides. So what up mixer settings should he use to take maximum advantage of his front wide speakers? <laughs> oh, what you're the... going to be a little unhappy with this. I was going to say that does anything actually up mix to the wides? Oh yes. I thought, was it just DTS, right? Yeah. The DTS neural X up mixer will put sounds into your front wide speakers. Uh, your Dolby surround up mixer never will. It will never put right. a single sound into a front wide speaker. So you cannot use the Dolby surround up mixer. You must use the DTS neural X up mixer. But uh, you said you just installed a 9.1.4 setup. So your mm-hmm. seven traditionals plus front wides and four overheads. Now you are going to have to choose. <laughs> Do you want to only have two overhead speakers or do you want to not have surround backs? Because there is no other way to use your Marantz 8805 with the DTS Neural X up mixer and have sounds come out of your front wides. The DTS Neural X up mixer can use a maximum of 11 speakers. It cannot use more than 11 speakers total, but it prioritizes. Right. And front wides are the last thing that mm-hmm. it adds. So you must have nine speakers before you get to front wides and then your front wides can be your 10th and 11 speakers out of the 11 total that it can use. So you can have 5.1.4 plus front wides. So you got ready to surround backs or you could have 7.1.2 and then add your front wides. But if you, you tell, yeah. Yeah. if you tell your Marantz AV805 that you have 13 speakers connected, 
the front wides aren't going to make any sound, even with the DTS Neuralex up mixer. You have to tell your Marantz that you only have 11 speakers. And I, of course, would recommend that it's 5.1.4 plus front wides. Uh, but you're going to have to. He doesn't have an option for that, anyways, because of where his overhead speakers are placed. I mean, if they're. That's right. What, is, what, is, what would he do? He would. Yeah. Oh, you, you want know. to keep the four overheads. I'm not going to. Yeah. Uh, so, absolutely nix the surround backs, but you actually have to, in the configuration of what speakers do I have, you have to say, I don't have surround backs in order for this to work. It's. Uh, you know, kind of a gut shot to do that because you were hoping to use 13 speakers total and you can really only use 11. Um, when DTSX Pro, if and when that ever comes out, I mean, they announced it, what, over a year ago now, it's DTS, right. they take their time. That'll be able to use more speakers, but we're, we're waiting on that and who knows if or when that'll actually come. Uh, yeah, that that's the situation. You have to limit it to 11 speakers total. So as mentioned, his overhead speakers are now labeled as front heights and rear heights. They're all in-ceiling speakers, so they don't look like the typical diagrams where heights are mounted up high and on the front and back walls. Any tips regarding his overhead speakers or thoughts he should be aware of since he wants to use them for Atmos DTS, X, and Aura 3D? Uh, yeah, don't worry about Aura 3D and just label them like they were before. That's what I would do. But if you're dead set on this, I mean, there is a range. There's mm -hmm. a range that uh, those speakers can be at if they fall within that range. I mean, even if they don't, I guess it doesn't really truly matter. But I, <laughs> Aura 3D is such a, I mean, go to your movies. How many do you have? How many have oh, you yeah. seen <laughs> that are Aura 3D? I mean... In North I would America, just place them, zero. <laughs> yeah, I would place them as, you know, front heights, rear heights. Mm -hmm. And then if or 3D ever, you ever get a movie, I that would be worth the cal recalibration for a second. You know, you'd well, I mean, relabel the, them. And the thing is, you, you don't have, if you want it to be compatible with all three, you don't have a choice. You have to label them as front yeah. heights and rear heights. That is the only configuration of labels that is compatible with all three immersive audio formats. But the thing is, there's not really any downside to that. Um, you know, if you had top middles as one of them, then that's different. But you right. had them in front of you and behind you. I mean, I don't know if you're at a 45 degree elevation angle or less, because front heights are supposed to go between 30 and 45 degrees elevation angle in front of you and behind you. That's where heights are supposed to fit within that window but they you're very well might be at a 45 degree elevation angle so you're not even out of spec whatsoever but on top of that we've mentioned how with dts x um if you label them as top fronts and top rears it will actually take some of that sound and put it into your front left right speakers and top fronts combined and your top rears and your surround backs which are now going to be turned off <laughs> combined right. whereas if you call them front heights and rear heights it discreetly puts those sounds only into your overhead speakers which i vastly prefer it's always the way i run my system is front heights and rear heights so in in all senses, you you've just like I said, I've mentioned before, we kind of fell ass backwards into a compatible format that works really well with all three. So there's right. not really any reason to to do anything other than label them as front heights and rear heights, and you're good to go. Carl, Carl was using the Apple HD monitor with his computer, but it died. So now he's <laughs> looking for a 30 inch or larger larger computer monitor that could do HDR. Any recommendations? Didn't we just suggest this for somebody? Oh, that was the curved one. It was the curved one, uh, but I, I'm going to recommend it again because honestly, as far as something reasonably priced, uh, Samsung's CHG70, uh, there is a 27-inch version and there's a 32-inch version. And the 32-inch version costs $500. Uh, but there's really nothing that is less expensive than that that I would ever recommend. It is a display HDR. So that's uh, Visa's certification of computer monitors for HDR performance. Mm -hmm. It is a display HDR 600 display. Don't get anything that's display HDR 400. It's uh, That's HDR in name only. You know, It'll accept right, the right. signal. Exactly. It'll show you a picture, but it really can't actually do it uh you know it's still 8-bit it's really not bright enough but hdr 600 display hdr 600 is reasonable it means you're getting local dimming although not a ton i think it's like 12 zones so it's really not a lot but at least you're getting a full backlight not edge lighting uh it means you're actually getting wide color not just in name only it means you're actually getting 600 nits so i can get behind that i mean if you want to go whole hog, there is a fantastic 32-inch display from Asus, but it's $4,000, at which point I'm like, why don't we just wait for the 48-inch LG OLED at that point? Because that's going to be right. 
way less expensive than four thousand dollars so honestly i think samsung's the way to go here the chg 70 the 32 inch is 500 bucks there you go so this is just a comment from i guess you yes is that what i'm reading here yeah. so carl uh shared an article from a home theater review titled what are the best uh 4k atmos home theater demos and three of those suggestions aren't actually in atmos so yeah. it was 4k <laughs> Atmos optional, I guess. I don't know. I mean, well, the thing is they talk about what the Atmos sound is like, uh, and they talk about it in Dunkirk, which is like famously Chris Nolan has been like, I don't do anything beyond 5.1, and that is what is on the Ultra HD Blu-ray is a 5.1 Dolby True HD mix. That's what's on there. There's no Atmos on the Dunkirk Ultra HD Blu-ray disc, and they're like, you got to listen to this Dolby Atmos soundtrack. I'm like, you don't know what Dolby Atmos is. Um, Jack Ryan season two, season one was That's an Atmos. Season two, say, season, one was is, an Atmos, yeah. season two is not an Atmos, but they're like, hey, check out this Dolby Atmos track. Um, and then they talk about a, a Rolling Stones concert from 2008. That was not, not an Atmos. Atmos. Probably not. So weird article. Um, they, they like the upmixer, I guess. I guess, I guess. so, but uh, the... I wasn't just saying this to to point and laugh. I'm saying it because the understanding amongst consumers of what Dolby Atmos is, and now I will say an article like this doesn't help. It doesn't help to say here are some great Atmos demos with content that we know for a fact is not in Atmos. But it's also just, it's an insight into even people who are writing about this stuff don't completely understand it. Yeah. um so yeah i got, got to be a little bit wary out there and uh yeah can't take everything at face value so rob not this rob different <laughs> rob rob currently has a 7.1 speaker setup using clip speakers some are the reference premiere series some are the regular reference series and a single svs pc 4000 for now he plans to get a second sub and all of his clip speakers are the 5.25 inch woofer models <laughs> Uh, the majority of his usage is gaming, with movies and TV only being about 20%. In subjective terms, he wants to increase the fullness of the sound he is hearing. Fullness. fullness. Mm. Mm. His understanding is that if he gets speakers with large woofers, that should give him a larger, fuller sound. Is he on the right track? Nope. No. <laughs> no. Not even a little bit. <laughs> nope. Nope. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, larger, fuller, and mind only not in how they actually sound yeah, yeah that that doesn't tell you anything unfortunately I, I wish it were yeah. as simple as that that would make life easier but no that that isn't how it works um yeah this is a bit tricky so i mean when someone comes with a subjective term like i want fuller sound what do they mean now we know he's coming from klipsch and we know so when klipsch tend to be a little bit on the right you know, side. they have a, a, a i don't i didn't want to say that i, I wasn't going to say that they have an extended, accentuated high end that some people find very enjoyable. And it's certainly very dynamic. And it certainly brings out details, like high frequency details. Yeah. They tend to ring, uh, uh, particularly if you've aimed your clip speakers, right. uh, you know, directly at Directly you. at you. Because mm -hmm. they're yes. quite directional. <laughs> Which is probably what he's done. Could be. So, uh, yeah, what, you're, what you really, I mean, the, the, the real answer to this question is you need to go start auditioning some speakers. That's the real answer to this question, but the reality is we, you know, we don't, uh, fullness doesn't really tell us much other than I would say you would want something that has a, uh, less accentuated high end and a more, uh, more mid base not, maybe. Yeah, I, w I didn't want to say I don't want to say that it has like a, a more you know, mid range or anything like that, but certainly a a, a generally flatter response. Um, you could yeah. maybe get this just with EQ. Uh, I possibly. Would, I, I mean, clip speakers are certainly that. efficient enough that you can in you know accentuate one particular part of the frequency range and they'll be able to output it for you. We're not yeah. worried about lacking headroom from clip speakers. But we can't look at a speaker and say, oh, the speaker will sound thus because right. of, you know, the way that it yeah, looks. Yeah, I mean, like the uh, famous example was RBH's Impression Series Towers, the first uh, the first generation of the Impression series, because they had those huge towers that had like three bass woofers and like two mid ranges with a tweeter in the middle of them. And everybody looked at those and goes, holy cow, they must dig down to like eight hertz. And it's like, nope, they hit about nope. 60. 
you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, how could that be? Well, because they used all of that surface area to play louder, not lower. Right. So just right. looking at the size or how many drivers or the overall size of the cabinet, whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily tell you how how you imagine they're going to sound. And it's certainly not as simple as going, these have six and a half inch drivers, so they're going to sound fuller than my speakers that have five and a quarter inch drivers. Absolutely not, cannot do something like that. But the the term of fullness, I mean, it could, could potentially mean many things, but what we want to start you with is accurate linear frequency response. And right. we can tell you almost certainly, at least across however many seats you have uh, with a single subwoofer, you very likely aren't getting linear bass to begin with. And that might be all of it. By by the time you add Could your be. second subwoofer, if you go through my whole 12-step guide to setting up dual subwoofers and you actually have uniform and linear bass response and that is crossing over into speakers, you might go, oh, that was actually everything that was everything i wanted was i needed that base to be more uniform and linear and that got me the fullness i wanted or it could be um you know our brains are such that if some part of the frequency range is standing out it will mask or de-accentuate mm -hmm. other parts and that whole thing we talked about high frequencies might be standing out more uh, it might be that the fullness that you want is there but you're just getting hit in the ears by these more shrill sounds or something like that and just tapering off the treble might be all you need to do and all of a sound it sounds, That's true. It sounds yeah. perceptually yeah. fuller to you so uh yeah there's a lot going on here certainly more than just i'm getting larger drivers but let's right. move on from there so he was considering switching to either svs ultra speakers or tecton double impact speakers mm -hmm. are those ones with the four tweeters is that no, the one the, that i'm they're thinking the ones of with the seven tweeters Seven tweeters, yes. that's much better. Uh, he'd been hoping to hear the Tecton speakers in person at Expona, but that has been postponed indefinitely uh, now. He's become very hesitant about trying Tecton now, though, because an owner posted it on AVS form about the experience he had trying to get a malfunctioning Tecton speaker diagnosed and repaired. Apparently, the, this owner knows the problem when he tried to play a 40 hertz test tone. Mm. He was told that playing test tones through his Tecton speakers was akin to rise, raising a car off the ground and then gunning it, which would blow the engine, or in this case, melt a voice coil, so it wasn't covered under warranty. Mm-hmm. All of this allegedly, we have to say allegedly here, but this is supposed well, You can't play a test tone because it's going to kill your speaker? <laughs> I mean, I... Who I, came up with this? Where is this in the fine print? I wouldn't necessarily recommend playing a 40 hertz sine wave through a like a speaker and not a subwoofer yeah, it's not necessarily low. the greatest yeah. idea but but if your crossover is properly designed right. it shouldn't it shouldn't, be it shouldn't a play that tone anyways yes every, tw every okay i'm not gonna say this i'll say it like this most okay let me say it this way every speaker that i've ever seen mount you know break mm -hmm, in this mm -hmm, way mm -hmm. is not with one exception has been in has been because the speaker did not have a properly designed crossover. I mean, we, we certainly could Almost say always. like, you know, we talked about how uh, if you were generating this test home in room EQ wizard and you had set it to zero decibels full scale. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had also turned your master volume up to zero and then you played a single sine wave tone. Like, yeah, you could blow something doing that. Right. But th and that's, that's how possible. I actually blew a tweeter in one of my speakers right. was uh, there was a te there was a sweep that I was playing mm -hmm. and the volume had gotten turned right, way right, up. Right. And the 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 test, the sweep that was given to me by another company was such that uh, it was very, very hot. Right. Like the mix on it was so hot that when it went up to the top, mm -hmm. the tweeter just went pop, pop. and just popped. <laughs> Uh, I did not, to me, that's not, that was misuse, but right. just putting a, you know, you should be able to play a 40 hertz Oh, you can tone. play a test tone. Uh, so yeah, so yeah. we will agree so that it is, it is possible to damage a speaker with a test tone, but it's dam Absolutely. possible to damage a speaker with any exceedingly loud signal. So I, right. I would consider that user error. I, I wouldn't blame a company for saying, I mean, you tried to play something at 140 decibels and you blew up your speaker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's user error. I will agree to that. Yeah. But just test tones in general. Anyway, we'll go on with the rest yeah. of the quote. Anyways, he eventually got them to repair the speaker without being charged. We had to pay for shipping in both directions, and the problem turned out to be a blown tweeter, one of the seven, since Tecton used an array of tweeters instead of a mid-range driver. So he never suspected that one of the tweeters was the problem since the test tone was such a low frequency. The, this owner was supposedly told was told not to run test tones since they would ruin any speaker. Well, apparently, I don't know. 
Okay. Yeah. Not any speaker. But in any case, do we have any opinions to offer regarding you, uh, SVS Ultra versus Tecton, and particularly when it comes to the fullness of sound and feeling completely immersed within the audio? Uh, we There's so many more factors that go right. along with this other than just the speakers themselves. Now, I got no problems recommending SVS, but you could, I mean, you would have a hard time picking two speakers that were more different as far as design and probably sound, to be honest <laughs> with you. You know, I would not expect these two speakers sitting next to each other in the room to sound the same. I would expect that Tecton to have a sound, whereas mm. I would expect the SVSs to be flat. I'm experiencing those, exper those, those speakers right now. I've got no problems recommending them. So if you know, you're know you dead set on getting one, SVS is a good way to go. Oh, yeah. Uh, this definitely, you know, it d very much sounds like you know, as we read through this 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 experience that you're relaying to us that I haven't read firsthand, that this user was probably told, "Hey, you're breaking, you broke the speaker because of what you did. Right. Don't do that again." Right. And he's or she is re is reporting that as being said that test tones should not be played through a speaker, yeah. which is probably not what they're saying. Yeah. There's two sides to exactly. this. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I would guess that this person did abuse the speaker and is now, you know, uh, what they call sour grapes sure. all over AVS forum about it. Uh, so don't play a 40 hertz test. I mean, it is weird that it managed hertz. to blow one of the tweeters. But then again, these tweeters are being used as mid range drivers. And who knows how the crossover is designed in there. And yeah. something got up there. And anyway, something blew. I don't doubt that something blew because they wouldn't have taken it yeah. back and repaired the thing. But uh, yeah, the two sides to that story. So that's not the reason. But I mean, in I, I just don't particularly recommend Tekton speaker designs. I mean, he's going for something. He's, he's trying to stand out in the market. Okay, fair enough, because there's a gazillion speakers out there, and a lot of them look very similar. So he's doing something to try and visually and clearly, obviously stand out from the pack as being different. But like we started this by saying, it would be a very good idea for you to begin auditioning other speakers. And SVS is a fantastic place to start because free two-way shipping. You know? right. So it's a very safe way to start. Now, if you were to get some SVS Ultras, I don't know if you're getting towers or bookshelves or whatever, but you bring them in and they do deliver this more full sound that you were going for. It's not because the woofers are bigger. <laughs> That's not the right. reason. There's a, all the things that we talked about previously in regard to this question. Uh, all of that is in play, but... Neither of us has any problem with you auditioning some SVS Ultra speakers because there's there's no financial risk to you. And when that's a good audition to have against something like Klipsch because the SVSs are very neutral. They're high in power handling, so they can still play nice and loud without distorting. Although you'll probably have to have the trim level set higher on the SVSs than your Klipsch's. Yeah, you know yeah. that that's a first certain. But there's there's so many more things that are you know, the room, yes. your setup, what you the know, bass is doing. Treatments. With, yeah, there's so many more things that are going on yeah. here. And the last thing I'm looking at is the size of the woofers. Right. So, you know, go ahead and audition. I, I would say give us some more information about your room. Uh, and, you know, at the very least, maybe if you've got these speakers pointed directly at your face, I would tow them out a little bit yeah. so that you get see if maybe that helps give you a little bit better experience. But like since you know you want to get dual subs anyway, I would almost encourage you to do that first. Get, get the yeah. dual subs going because, like I say, that might be it. You might be like, oh, that was everything I was looking for. I don't even have to get new speakers. But start with that. And then if you just want to compare the SVSs to your Klipsch's, start with that. And if you're like, neither the Klipsch's nor the SVS Ultras are giving me exactly what I want, well, then you can start looking elsewhere. But that's how I would begin this process. Infinite Gary. Gary wants to revisit the whole topic of mixing ported subs with sealed subs. Similar to what Chris mentioned last week when Gary chatted with SVS, they warned him away from uh, pairing his older PB12 Ultra with any sealed model. They said to go for a ported model with a similar tuning frequency, but they mentioned that one reason to avoid mixed porting and sealed is because of the significant differences in their phase responses. Hmm. What? This is a line that was told <laughs> to him, or at least what he recalls of it. Yeah, so what does that mean and in real-world terms if Gary were to take his PB12 Ultra and pair it with a PB2000 Pro and then remove the PB2000 Pro and pair his PB12 Ultra with the SB2000 Pro instead, what difference would he actually hear? Probably none. Probably but, none. Uh, Depends a lot on your room. Depends a lot yeah, as long on as your the, room. As, as long as the SB2000 is not in too small of a room, I would see that that would not be a problem. But too big of a room. Phase? 
Yeah. I've not really seen that. I don't understand where they're coming from with that one, but well, I mean it you know it starts so once you get into the range of where the port is actually contributing to the sound, right? Your group delay does go up. I mean, that's just a fact. In a ported subwoofer, once the port is actually contributing to the sound, your group delay gets higher. Uh, the sealed sub will have lower group delay, but also lower output at that same frequency. You know, same driver, same amplifier, similar cabinet sizes. The sealed sub will have lower output than the ported once you're into the port's range. But the port will have longer group delay, which is a portion of phase response. It's in the time domain that we're talking about things sure. here. Um, above that, they perform identically. I mean, so ever so slightly differently than identically, but I mean essentially identically it's the driver that's contributing almost all of the sound uh above the uh where the port starts to contribute and the port starts to contribute right around the part where the subwoofer in a sealed subwoofer design starts to roll off so in most of the svs subs that's in the 35 to 40 hertz range that's where you start to see that difference is it a measurable difference yeah i mean if you go over to like database you know yeah, sure. it's right there he's got the measurements there it is there are um, group delay differences you can call those phase response differences it's it's the time domain that we're looking at below about 40 hertz you start to see those differences pop up in all all of the subs essentially but you know svs to svs it's right there um so the question becomes for the output level you're looking to achieve in the let's call it 20 to 40 hertz octave right if the sealed sub can deliver that amount of output that you're looking for, and that's so room-dependent, hugely room-dependent, then right. the ported sub is going to be able to do the, exactly the same thing. Yes, its port will be contributing, but it's like it's not working as hard, basically. But both of them are fully within the capabilities of the sub. Neither of them is distorting. Both of them are hitting that output range. It's when you get to the larger room that the sealed sub starts to roll off. It can't even reach the output level that you're trying to get to. The ported right. sub gets to the output level that you were trying to reach, but like half a millisecond later because you had to wait for the group delay, the response of the room and the port to contribute to that volume. So basically, if you were in a situation where you could hear the difference, it would be that in that octave between 20 and 40 hertz, you might start to get the response of more similar to what one sub would be doing in that room versus two. You're kind of getting into a weakest link situation if you're in a room large enough. The sealed box is now not able to get to the output level, but the ported right. box is. So right. it's more that you might not start to notice if you moved seat to seat in this very large room that you don't have uniformity in that low octave, that 20 to 40 hertz octave. It's starting to look more similar to what a single sub in that room would look like. But, right, right, right. you know, so, I mean, again, to clarify, SVS is giving advice that is safer, right? They, they don't know for sure. Somebody can tell them, here's the room size I got, but, oh, I forgot to mention, it's actually open to my kitchen, you know? And, right, and right. that happens to us, too. So that's why we say, right. if you're in an enclosed room of the dimensions you told us, then this will work. If you actually have an opening to some other part of your house, we're, uh, that's out the window now. It's a different situation. So what SVS is saying is very safe advice. It's going to work for everybody. They're not going to run into a situation where somebody goes, well, actually, my room was smaller than I told you, and the you know ported and ported somehow didn't work. No, it's still going to work. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the too long didn't read version, if, you're not going to hear it. There's no if you there is there is a measurable difference, oh, yeah. but as long as the it's the proper sub size and we you know the it, we will tell you if it's not, uh, you're not going to hear the difference. <laughs> so Gary uses a Sewell HDMI splitter in one of his setups where he's still using a Pioneer Curo. He knows that if he plugs his FiOS cable box directly into Curo, he has the option to select dot for dot or dot to dot aspect ratio mode. But if he plugs his FiOS box into the Sewell, he and then the Sewell into the Curo, he only gets options for auto, full, and wide. No more dot to dot. Any idea why that would be? Any the other display connected to the Sewell splitter is an older 1080p OLED. So dot for dot usually is uh, you know one to they sometimes call it one, one to one, one or, or like pixel that. to pixel or pixel right. to pixel. Yeah. So it 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 just means that you're you know the it's giving you the actual 
physical mapping. Now, why would the swivel make a difference here? My own, my thought would be the HDMI handshake somewhere along, you know, it's yeah. doing something. But that's the only thing that I can possibly imagine would be the difference. I, I the older 1080p OLED model, I don't think should make a difference that's connected to this thing. Yeah, I mean, but... as far as I know, they're both 1080p. There were Pioneer Kuros that were actually 1366 by 768 resolution. Some of those did exist. Right. I don't think that's what Gary has because I'm pretty sure his was like a 60 inch. Um, but some of the 50 inches did have 1366 by 768 resolution. And if that were the case, it would explain this because the OLED doesn't have that resolution. So if you have both of these displays connected to the two right. outputs of the Sewell, the Sewell, uh, you know, well, essentially your Fios box is going to see two displays at the other end of the signal chain, and it's going to only output a resolution that works for both of them. Right. And if your Kuro isn't actually 1920 by 1080, then your Fios box is going to have to either put out 720p or 1080 because that's what's compatible with the OLED as well. So I'm not sure. This could be that he's got one of those curls that's 1366 by 768. That would totally explain this. But if this were one of the curls that was 1920 by 1080, I'm not totally sure why why this would be happening. Yeah. Uh, Your explanation is about the only thing that makes any sense yeah, to me. Yeah, uh, I mean, it the experiment yeah. you could try is actually like unplug the OLED from the Sewell. So you, you still have the Fios goes into the Sewell, the Sewell goes into the curl, but the OLED is no longer attached because if yeah. that allows the dot for dot, then now we know that it's know. something yeah. to do with what the OLED says it can accept is not the same as what the Kuro says it can right. accept. And, this, and the Fios box is like, well, I have to send you something that you can both accept. So that that would be the explanation there. Adam. Adam is finishing his basement. The whole thing is unfinished at the moment, except for the ceiling, which is already drywalled, and uh, seven foot, nine inches throughout. There are some soffits in the places that drop the ceiling to six foot eight. Mm -hmm. He's trying to figure out if he should create an enclosed room to use as a dedicated theater. The majority of the framing for the basement is already planned out and will turn... Most of the basement to a large bar and rec room, none of that is going to change at this point, but he could definitely use a portion of this large room as his theater area. But of course, it would be totally open. There's a much smaller section of the basement where he could build an enclosed room. The space, uh, the unfinished space is 12 by 22. But since he would have to finish some exterior walls, the in finished dimensions would be smaller and, you know, yeah. maybe by inches or maybe a little bit more, depending on how things go. Either way, he wants six seats. So he'd use uh, the theater for gaming and uh, watching sports in addition to movies. The large bar and rec room will have a TV in it no matter what. But he's trying to decide if his full surround system should go in the rec room or the much or in a much smaller dedicated room. So if you're looking at the images on YouTube, there's a blue rectangle towards the bottom of the diagram he sent. That is where he could conceivably build this fully enclosed room to be a completely dedicated theater. Uh, on one side of one of the party walls would be the garage. On the other side is an exterior wall. And then uh, to the back, there would be where the stairs come down. And he mentioned that uh, one of the soffits that he mentioned is um, like right along those stairs. That's where mm. one of those soffits would be. And then uh, he's already framed out this section that he's marked in orange on his diagrams as a large rec room and bar and everything like that he's got this sort of green dotted area which is where the the theater type area might go if if he doesn't build the dedicated room but he's like basically uh well yeah the, this actually is his first question so i'll let you read that up so what do we think with an enclosed room that's about 11 and a half by 21 be too small he's envisioning putting a false wall next to the garage with two rows of three seats each but he figures the back row would be basically against the back wall and the front row would probably have to be pushed to one side to keep a walkway. Meanwhile, uh, seating is uh, easy in the large rec room, but it would be a wide open space without l full light control. So what do we think we should do? This is now 21 feet deep. I mean, my immediate thought was to let's have this room be wider than it is long. Let's have a wide seating area. Because if your room is 21 yeah. feet wide, you can absolutely fit six seats across. You can get one of those nice curved, like, uh, three love seat type of sit-ups, you yeah. know? And uh, and then your room is well, about 11 and a half feet front to back. I To me, that makes more sense than trying to fit... And then you're going to be sitting, what, about eight feet back from this... Oh, you could, you know, you could be screen. nine feet. Yeah. Yeah. You could be nine feet. You could even be that ten feet. Work. You know, you have a foot and a half of space behind you. So we're gonna say no surround backs if you go wider than wider than uh, long. But uh, to me, that makes sense that you got the soffit that is behind you now. 
Uh, he said the soffit's about 18 inches, uh, you know, front to back type of thing on the soffit. Mm-hmm. So now that's behind you. You're sitting right in front of that. So you're about nine and a half, ten 10 feet, eyes to screen. And, uh, and you got six seats going across, which you got the width for in a 21 foot wide room. I, I, yeah. If you can you have the, a dedicated room, I want you to have a dedicated room. <laughs> right. Uh, and you would want to put your front speakers about as wide as your entire couch, I guess, is what you would have to end up going much, with. Yeah. I mean, it, de- it depends on how many people actually sit in yeah. here on the regular. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's going to viewing angles are going to be a little bit weird on those outside. But I mean, chairs. if this is fully dedicated then he can have a screen that doesn't have any problems with being off angle. Because, I mean, on your, you know, regular matte white screen, you could be way off to the side. It still looks yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't bother. There's no problem at straight, all. Yeah. Um, to, I, I think that's the solution here. Because, I, I, so, if your room is only 11 and a half feet wide, I agree with you that trying to fit in two rows of seats, like, it can be done, but it starts to feel, like, squished in. You know what I mean? And yeah. trying to walk from one to the other, and where does the door go and stuff like that. But, like, a nice, like, he's taught he almost wants kind of like a sports feel, you know, you're going to have some friends over, watch big game. It's like, you got this nice wide seating area. You could still put some extra seats, you know, towards the back corners. You can have some bar stools there. You can have some bean bags down in front. If you need even more seats than that, you know, like you get this nice curved row of seats that goes in there. That's nice and wide. I like that. Yeah. So what do we think his screen size should be? What are our thoughts on a projector versus an 85 inch flat panel? Uh, if, I mean, in this room, you're going to be 11 feet. Well, I mean, you're going to be nine feet away from it. 85 inches is is really too small. <laughs> honestly, I mean, for full, if you want like full cinemascope movies, if you want yeah. that feel and you're going full dedicated theater, then I would go bigger if you have the dedicated room for sure. Yeah. Um, well, let's see if we're saying nine and a half, ten feet. I mean, that's almost on the back wall. Yeah. Somewhere between 110 and 120. If if you like to sit, if you go to the movie theater and you're one of the people who likes to sit a bit closer, you like, you know, probably not the front row, but, you know, closer to the screen. If that's you, then probably go 120. If you like to sit more towards the back one third of the theater, then probably go 110. Uh, that, that'd be my recommendation to you. And again, this is all predicated on you agreeing that making the room wider than long <laughs> makes sense to you. But I think it does. I, I think that, and then you're not yeah. worrying about a false wall anymore. You know, your speakers can just go to either side of your screen. You're not dealing with false wall, acoustically transparent, keeps the cost lower. All works out. All right. You're getting there. I know. I it's I'll do I think I can fit this is a it's not that long. It's a lot of reading, but it's not that many questions. All right. Uh I'll do this one and then you can continue on that without me because I got I've got my phones blowing up yep, over yep, here. Yep. Uh, Brian. Brian says he started listening to AV Rent only recently, but we already convinced him to try an S- uh, SVS SB1000 in his music only setup, and he loves it. So now he's here to ask for some help with the TV. Brian and his wife don't watch a lot of TV, and he hasn't bought a new one in over 10 years. He'd like to get a 55 inch that will be enjoyable for movies and for playing F1 racing games on his PS4. He's got a s- section of wall that's just wide enough for a 55 inch TV, but it appears that. Pretty much all TV wall mounts are designed to attach to uh, to two studs, and the studs in this section of the wall are laid out in such a way that it's centering a regular TV uh, wall mount would be basically impossible. So the blue things on the wall That's here where the studs are. The are. Studs. So it's basically okay, a stud the, right in the middle. <laughs> And then towards the two sides, yeah, that's you know, right. like within like maybe six to eight inches, or maybe a foot from the, the from the, the edges, edges to the here. two edges. Yeah. yeah. So I see what he means. So he searched for wall mounts that can be uh, shifted horizontally and found one uh, Santa Smalla going for about two fifty and a hundred dollar option from a company called Mounting Dream. I've never heard about them, but mm. whatever. He's thinking he'd like to mount the TV and a sound bar. It's a normal wood two by fours uh, in the wall. Will that be structurally sound and strong enough to hold everything? Is the hundred dollar Mounting Dream mount good enough, or should he return it? And, oh, he already bought it. Should he return it and get the Santa's? Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about that mounting place. Do, you, do we? I, know anything I don't know about anything them? about the. There's there's nothing about it or the specs or anything like that that makes me particularly worried. I mean, he's talking about a 55 inch, which the weight on that is not 
not as negligible it's not as a, long as it's not a, not a problem and a, you know any soundbar i mean i don't think he's thinking about getting like that enormous um sennheiser soundbar so i'm pretty sure he's right. looking at a normal soundbar from samsung or something like that so i'm the weight is not a problem to me at all the the design of the thing looks perfectly reasonable i will mention Sanus does have a different model than the one that he mentioned, um, okay. which allows this side-to-side -side shifting, and it's only one hundred and thirty dollars. So I mean, like that's the one. I, the, the one I'm talking about is the uh, OLF eighteen. Um, that's the one I would have pointed you to offhand because we always trust Sanus and their mounting is super easy and all that. But the one that you got looks completely reasonable to me. I, I really don't think you need to return that. I'm not worried about a fifty-five inch and a sound bar. Yeah. So his absolute maximum budget is a grant. He's leaning towards the 55-inch Sony X950G. He's also considering the Samsung Q70R. Or if we say they get something else, he'll consider that as well. He likes the Sony, that Sony supports Dolby Vision. And since his PS4 doesn't do variable refresh rate and he isn't planning to get a PS5 for several years, he wouldn't make use of Samsung's gaming advantages either. So what do we say? I have no problems with that. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you really wouldn't be disappointed with either of those choices. You know. Yeah, those are both... Those are both Great TVs. Those are both yeah. full array local dimming, very nice, high native contrast. About the only thing I would really mention here is that uh, you can still find uh, the X900F Sonys, which were the year previous, mm. um, which actually had higher native panel contrast, like just the LCD panel itself had even higher native contrast than the X950G that just came out in 2019. So I really liked the X900Fs. Those are the ones that came out in 2018. And they're still around and they're a little bit less expensive. And there's like, feature-wise, there's no difference. <laughs> yeah. So that's about the only thing I, I, I would mention to you is that uh, have a peek if there's a 55-inch X900F at an even lower price point and, and snag one of those. That, that would be my suggestion there. We good? Uh, yeah, I got to go. <laughs> Sounds all right. We knew this so, was possible. So uh, everybody out there, stay safe. Uh, you know, hunker down and uh, you know, don't touch anything you're not supposed to touch. Don't touch your face and keep your family safe. And we will see, or I will see you next week. So thanks, everybody. You got it. Thanks, Tom. Later. We'll see you next week. We're shifting only to only Rob here. Hello, hello. All right, let's uh, carry on with a couple more questions. And then we actually had some uh, user reviews that were sent in. So I'm going to go through those too. So Adam G. Adam is using an Epson 5040UB with a Denon X3600H AV receiver and a Panasonic UB420, uh, also an Xbox One X. Those are his sources. So when he's using his Panasonic player, everything's fine. He gets 4K, he gets HDR. But with his Xbox One X, he gets a warning that tells him your display does not support HDR10. And the only output that he's getting is 4K at 60 hertz in standard dynamic range. So he tried swapping the HDMI cables because his Panasonic was working. His Xbox One X was not, but that made no difference. So what is the issue here? Uh, so this is the limitation of the Epson 5040UB. Um, first of all, it's HDMI inputs only support up to 10.2 gigabits per second. They don't support the full 18 gigabits per second of HDMI 2.0. Uh, but also in addition to that, um, so partly because of the bandwidth limitation, but also just because of what that display supports, um, the Epson 5040UB cannot accept a 4K 60 HDR signal. It just can't do it. Uh, when it's 4K at 60 hertz, it can only take up to an 8-bit signal with 420 chroma subsampling. That allows 4K 60 to fit within the 10.2 gigabit per second um, bandwidth limitation. So 4K 60 with HDR is not something that the 5040UB can support. So you're like, well, how does the Panasonic player manage to send 4K with HDR from Ultra HD Blu-rays? Well, almost all Ultra HD Blu-rays, except for like Ang Lee's two movies, the uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk and uh, Gemini Man, uh, all other Ultra HD Blu-rays are at 24 frames per second, not 60. So 4K at 24 frames per second with HDR fits within the 10.2 gigabits per second bandwidth that the Epson 5040UB can accept, but 4K at 60 would not. So if you tried to watch Gemini Man from Ultra HD Blu-ray, 
that also would not work on your 5040 UB because that is 4K 60 with HDR. So you did nothing wrong in your settings uh, and it wasn't your HDMI cables to blame. This is a limitation of the projector that you're using. And that was sort of the, the big thing that the Epson 5050 added uh, was the ability to accept 4K 60 with HDR. So the question sort of becomes, what do you do here? And honestly, uh, hopefully somebody else can chime in on this because I don't own an Xbox One X or an Xbox One S. I still have a day one Xbox One, uh, which doesn't do 4K at all. So I'm actually not sure if you're able to set the Xbox One X to output 1080 resolution obviously you can do 1080 at 60 frames per second uh but if you can do 1080 60 frames per second with hdr i'm not sure if that's an available option uh you might even be able to do 1440p at 60 frames per second with hdr i'm not sure if that's available um if it is to me it's more important to have the 60 frames per second for games and the hdr to me both of those things make a bigger impact than just the jump from 1080p resolution to 4k resolution um you know we know he can do 4k 60 without HDR, 4K60 at 8 bits in SDR. He can play his Xbox One X games that way. Um, but, you know, it'd be nicer to keep both the 60 frames and the HDR. So if you're allowed to just drop the resolution, but keep the uh, HDR and the frame rate, that is absolutely what I would recommend doing. On top of that, the Epson 5040UB, the panels in there, the LCD panels in that projector are actually 1080p resolution. They're 1920 by 1080, uh, but they wobble the panel twice per frame to give you a little bit higher resolution, 1080p times two, uh, and that's how they show 4K signals. So if you're actually just sending 1080p out of your Xbox One X, uh, you could kind of turn off that pixel shifting and just get exact one-to-one -one pixels, uh, 1080p pixels showing up there. Uh, so yeah, all depends on whether the Xbox One X allows you to retain HDR at a lower resolution signal. I'm, I'm not certain if it does. I think it does because uh, computers let to you and Xbox Ones are basically computers. So that's what you got to give a try there. Now, let's see. Uh, our next questioner is also named Adam, but this is Adam P. So this is a different Adam. Uh, Adam's primary seats are about 17 feet from where his screen will go. So he's looking to get a big 150-inch projection screen. Uh, he wants it to be acoustically transparent and also motorized with tab tensioning. I agree with that. Uh, I mean... I agree with tab tensioning at all times if you're going to have a roll down screen, if at all possible. Uh, it just does make the screen nice and flat and taut and you don't have any waves or wrinkles. So I'm in agreement with all of this. Uh, he's come across Elite's Saker tab tension screens that use their Acoustic Pro UHD material. Uh, he's seen them some places as low as $2,200 for the 150 inch size, but typically the price seems to be up around $2,800. So he basically asks, are there any other options that would be just as good for less money or better than the Elite at the, about the same price. Um, so I'm not aware of any that are motorized, tab tensioned, good acoustically transparent, 150 inches available uh, at a lower price point than about $2,500. Um, you know, it's very similar to the Elite. So I'm not aware of cheaper um, with just as good quality, but I am aware of something that, in my opinion, is higher quality at right around the same price, and it's Seymour. Um, Seymour AV, um, you can get their regular uh, XD acoustically transparent fabric. You can get uh, the 150-inch size. They only make motorized roll-down with tensioning. They don't have uh, a roll-down that doesn't have tensioning. And it's uh, right, around, right about $2,500. So once you get up to that screen size, um, the price difference is, is not there. It's <laughs> negligible if it's anything. Uh, but I really like Seymour's uh, materials when it comes to acoustic transparent. I think they're the best. So given that the price is going to be the same, that's the way I'd go. Uh, you could check with a Loon Vision. Um, to see they have their audio weave 4k again their motorized roll down only comes intentioned um, really good screens in Canada they're actually going to be less expensive than importing a Seymour AV uh, so in Canada I would point you to a Loon Vision but it's the reverse when you go uh, uh, 
importing Elune Vision from Canada into the U.S., suddenly Elune Vision becomes more expensive than Seymour typically if you're in the States. So, But either Seymour or Elune Vision is probably the way I would go here because the price is right about the same as what Elite is saying, but I like their fabrics better. Uh, so second question from Adam P. His theater is actually a detached garage and he only uses it during the warmer months he's in Massachusetts. So would there be any issues with keeping the, cre- uh, the screen stored? So it's going to be rolled up. It's going to be in its case, but he'll keep it in his detached garage during the winter. Um, honestly, I'm not certain. Uh, Massachusetts, as far as I'm aware, can get pretty darn cold in the winter. I'm assuming that your garage either has minimal or perhaps even no insulation and likely gets very, very cold in there. It's not quite the same as having it right outside. It's still covered, but I'm betting it gets pretty cold. Um, Typically, manufacturers will have a sort of stated range of usable temperatures, and then sometimes they'll state uh, storage temperatures as well. Most items in general they don't typically recommend getting below zero degrees celsius getting below 32 fahrenheit um but my my real answer here is check with the manufacturer certainly if you just call or email seymour av um and ask them about potentially storing it in in winter conditions uh he'll absolutely tell you whether that's okay or not i don't i don't know for certain the answer the best thing you can do is check directly with the manufacturer and they should be able to tell you if that'll be okay or not my inclination, though, is that I bet it gets below uh, freezing in the winter in that inside that garage, and I, I'm betting it would be a better idea to bring it into the house. Um, you know, when it's rolled up, it's not too bad, although 150 inches is pretty heavy. Get a friend. <laughs> get, get, uh, have a friend uh, help you carry that into your house is what I'm betting would be the safer answer there. But don't know for sure. Check. All right, uh, let's answer a couple more here. Uh, Francis uh, wrote to us on Facebook. France, uh, Francis came across Dream Media Home Theater's YouTube channel. Yes, yes, those have shown up in my recommendations frequently as well. And uh, one of their setup videos, he noticed that they recommended uh, on a Denon Morant AV receiver. It was using Odyssey. Uh, they set Odyssey dynamic volume to on. That was in addition to having dynamic EQ set to on. And they set the... Uh, so the, the label is LPF for LFE. That stands for low pass frequency for a low frequency effects. They set that to 80 hertz instead of the default, which is 120 hertz. So Francis asks, has he been doing it wrong or is Dream Media wrong in their settings? Um, okay, so first of all, with that low pass frequency for the low frequency effects channel, that should be set to 120 hertz. I don't really even know why they give you the option of setting it to anything else. It is specifically for the low frequency effects channel. All right. That is a dedicated channel. That is the 0.1 in your 5.1 or your 7.1 channel soundtrack. It is a dedicated channel. It's its own thing. It plays sounds up to 120 Hertz. If you lower that, you do roll off the upper range of the low frequency effects channel but that sound doesn't get rerouted to your speakers it, it doesn't work that way you know the the low frequencies that get rolled off of your speakers they get rerouted to your subwoofer but the low frequency effects channel if you uh have the low pass frequency set lower than 120 hertz those frequencies just get rolled off and they just vanish. They're just gone. They don't get rerouted. So why it's even an option has been a bit of a mystery to me all this time. I'm like, no, you, you keep the whole low frequency effects channel. You leave it at the default of 120. They're incorrect to have done that. Um, and then as far as the Odyssey dynamic volume, I mean, that that's not right or wrong. There are potential uses for Odyssey dynamic volume. For my parents, I set it to on and I set it to medium. There's uh, off, low, medium, and high settings. And what Odyssey dynamic volume does is dynamic range compression. It makes it so that very loud sounds are made quieter and very quiet sounds are made louder so that everything you're listening to is closer in volume. You have shrunk the dynamic range of the sound. Now, for my parents in their living room, primarily just watching television, it means that the commercials are not way louder than the uh, regular program that you're watching. And it means that if people are speaking quietly, their voices are now automatically made louder so that everything is closer to being the same volume level all the time. 
And I'm totally fine with that if that is the scenario that you're using it. You know, of course, I would like to retain the entire dynamic range if I'm able to. So I would, as a default, have Odyssey dynamic volume turned off so that the entire dynamic range is available. But there are certainly cases where turning it on makes a whole lot of sense so that you don't have huge swings in volume. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's what they were doing for their client because they're they're an installation company. Dream Media Home Theater is an installation company. And then they show the installations that they do on their YouTube channel. Now, I will just say there's a lot that I could nitpick about Dream Media. I mean, all... I don't know. All the installations I've I've seen, I haven't watched all their videos by any means. I've only seen a handful of them. But like they've I've never seen them install acoustic treatment. <laughs> and it's kind of funny because um typically it seems like they're either using the mic that's built into their camera or a, a separate mic. They're not using like lavalier mics or a boom mic or something like that. And it's like you can hear it in their videos that these rooms that they're in are reverberating. Like they're not great acoustics. And I'm like for a company that installs theaters professionally and then shows videos about those installations of like please start caring about room acoustics <laughs> like put some acoustic treatments in there um and who knows maybe that's why they think dynamic volume is a big help because it, it stops the stops the big booms from reverberating around these untreated rooms that seem to be all the videos they show so i don't know if it's clients telling them no way no how i don't know if it's that they don't recommend it to their clients that they acoustically treat their rooms i don't know what it is but that's my biggest pet peeve with their videos is like man all this nice equipment that you're showing installed and it's installed very nicely no problems there i'm like let's care about the room acoustics a little bit more okay let's move on to chris t who wrote on twitter uh he says can we lay out exactly how the epson 5040ub handles hdr because if you're trying to sort through how the Epson 5040 UB projector uh, handles HDR signals, it is confusing. And then when it comes to comparing the 5040 UB to the 5050 UB, aside from uh, the thing that we just talked about a couple questions ago, where the 5050 UB can handle 4K60 with HDR and the 5040 UB cannot, so that's cut and dry. Other than that very cut and dry difference, what are the real differences, especially now that the 5040 UB can be found for about half the price of the 5050? It makes it very enticing to go to that 5040 if you're like, I don't super need 4K60 HDR because that's just a cut and dry feature. So let's talk about how the 5040UB handles HDR because it isn't the easiest thing to completely understand. So first of all, there are four, I will call them decent out of the box picture modes to use on the 5040UB. And I say they're decent out of the box because they have the D6500 white point, they're pretty close to that. And the gray scale of these four picture modes is pretty darn decent. The color accuracy of these four picture modes is pretty darn decent out of the box. And then the other ones like dynamic and there's one that's like for black and white, you know, those don't have the correct white point and correct gray scale and, cor and accurate colors out of the box. So the four that I'm talking about are called bright cinema, natural cinema, and digital cinema. Yes confusing names because three out of the four have the word cinema in them uh but yeah we're starting with bright cinema natural cinema and digital cinema so right away the main thing to understand is that the bright cinema and natural picture modes are meant for rec 709 color they're meant for your blu-ray hdtv rec 709 color that's what they're set up for the other two picture modes that are named cinema and digital cinema put a physical color filter in place, which lowers the light output somewhat because there's a filter being put into the light path, but it widens the gamut of colors to the DCI P3 standard. That's your Ultra HD uh, color standard DCI P3 wider color gamut. So right away, we have this pretty obvious thing where it's like, well, if I'm watching HDTV or regular Blu-ray with Rec. 709 color, I probably want to use either the bright cinema or the natural picture mode. And then if I'm watching an Ultra HD Blu-ray or something streamed from, you know, a, a streaming box that's in Ultra HD in HDR with wide color, it would be nice to get that full DCI P3 color. I'll probably want to use either the cinema or the digital cinema picture mode. Now, the Epson 5040UB will not automatically switch between picture modes when it detects 
an HDR signal versus a standard dynamic range signal. You will have to manually switch the picture mode if you want to switch the how wide the color gamut is that you're looking at. If you want to put that color filter into the light path and get the full wide DCI P3 color, you will need to manually switch to either cinema or digital cinema. And if you want to go back to Rec 709 color, you will need to manually switch to either bright cinema or natural. So that's the thing to be aware of there. Now, Let's say you're watching a regular Blu-ray, you're in the natural picture mode. So bright cinema, as the name implies, overall, everything is made brighter. It uses a lower numerical gamma by default. Um, the lamp is natively set higher, although you can change that if you want to. The contrast and brightness are all adjusted. It's basically a good setting for a quote-unquote daytime setting for your projector. It's a brighter overall uh, out-of-the-box picture mode. And then the natural picture mode is really ideal for standard dynamic range content in the dark. That's where it's perfect to use that. So right there, you've got a day mode and a night mode for your standard dynamic range content. Bright cinema for day mode, natural for night mode. Um, let's say that's what you're doing uh, and you're, you're in the natural picture mode, let's say. You've been watching a Blu-ray in the dark. Looks fantastic. Now you switch over to your Ultra HD Blu-ray and it detects that an HDR signal is coming in now. It stays in the natural picture mode. It stays in Rec. 709 color but it does go into an HDR, I'll call it like a sub mode, all right? It's still the natural picture mode, but it does go into HDR sub mode within the natural picture mode, but you're not getting the wide color. You'd have to manually switch to do that. And in the Epson 5040UB, it gives you four HDR sub modes. So there's modes one, two, three, and four. Now what those do, these HDR sub modes, the four of them, HDR sub mode one, is set up for 1000 nit content. It will tone map that quite reasonably to the capabilities of the projector. You'll retain pretty much all the detail that you would see in 1000 nit HDR content. And that's kind of what you get with HDR sub mode one. Modes two, three, and four progressively try to retain higher and higher nit levels, right? So if you're watching a movie that was mastered to 2,000 nits or 4,000 nits, or you're playing a video game that was mastered to 10,000 nits, then that's basically what modes 2, 3, and 4 are. They try to allow you to keep all that detail in these higher nit ranges above 1,000. But the problem is that it's not like there's more light to be had out of this projector. So everything gets compressed down into the available light of the projector. And the whole image starts to look darker and darker as a result. You know, I've got this peak that's up at 4,000 nits, but I have to tone map that all the way down to the ability of this projector and then squish all of the light below 4,000 nits. Everything gets squished down and everything looks darker and darker. So by and large, I don't really recommend using anything other than HDR mode one. Almost all of your streaming sources are mastered to 1,000 nits. And if you're connecting an Ultra HD Blu-ray player, well, the perfect companion is a Panasonic UB420 because it will use its HDR optimizer to make sure that all of your discs come out of that player at 1000 nits and never any higher. And you can stick to just using HDR sub mode one. So with the 5040UB, it's not too difficult if that's what you're dealing with because you will have to manually switch. If you want the wide color, you're gonna manually switch over to either cinema or digital cinema. And there, they're very similar again. The digital cinema picture mode is meant for a completely black room. The cinema picture mode is a little bit brighter, uh, but both of them have the wide color filter in place. So again, you can, I wouldn't really call it day and night mode because neither of them is really bright enough with the filter in place for like a day mode. But uh, this is where what some people will do is they'll say, okay, when it's time for HDR, if I'm totally blacked out, if this movie is mastered to a thousand nits and overall the image looks bright enough, then I'll use the digital cinema picture mode. I'll use HDR mode one within that. I'll get the full wide color. It'll tone map a thousand nits very nicely and everything looks correct. But some movies in HDR just tend to look dim. 
You know, even on a OLED, they tend to look a little bit dim and you might want to adjust it a little bit. So some people, what they'll do is they'll set up the cinema picture mode as a overall brighter looking image so that if you happen to be watching an HDR movie that on the whole looks a little bit dim all the time, you have this second wide color HDR dedicated picture mode that you can switch to that's overall brighter. How do you make it overall brighter? Well, there's a gamma adjustment within the settings. And not only is it like, oh, I can pick, you know, multiple choice. They actually give you like a point by point slider or you can adjust on a graph um, the gamma, not only in an overall sense, but if you're like, you know, the highlights look okay, but the shadows are all too dark, you can brighten just the shadows in this sort of graph slider that's available within the Epson. So it's a lot of adjustment that you can do when it comes to HDR. Uh, first of all, choosing manually choosing which picture mode for whether or not you have the wide color. Then you have the two modes. One of them's naturally a little bit brighter than the other, cinema being a little bit brighter than digital cinema. Uh, you have these four HDR sub modes to choose from, but I'd probably only ever use mode one. And then if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, you have this graphical slider where you can adjust the gamma of the signal in there. That's how it works on the 5040UB. On the 5050UB, life is so much simpler. <laughs> you still want to manually switch between picture modes uh, depending on whether you want the wide color filter in the light path or not. That's actually still the same. So you're still manually choosing whether you're going to wide color or not. But once you have done that, it just goes into HDR mode. There is a button right on the remote for the 5050 UB that just brings up a 16 point slider where you can brighten or dim the HDR image as a whole. You don't have to deal with two different picture modes for HDR. You don't have to deal with digging into a menu and going into a graphical uh, gamma slider adjustment on a graph. Like, no, there's just a 16 point scale. It brightens or dims the image as a whole. It's so much easier to use. And other than just switching picture modes for wide color or uh, Rec. 709 color, it's much easier on the 5050. So that's part of it there. The 5050 UB, they updated the pixel shifting, the wobbling of the panel. Basically, it shifts to its alternate position faster and stays there longer. So instead of like a, you could consider the 5040 UB as, you know, shifting more slowly between the two positions as it wobbles the panel. Whereas the 5050, it's like it more rapidly moves to one. It stays there for a moment and rapidly moves back and stays there for a moment and so forth. So that actually allows it to be brighter overall. And if there was any blurring uh, in the 5040 UB, that is reduced in the 5050 because it's moving the panel more quickly and then holding it there for a moment. Um, so there's advantages in the 5050 in that sense. For HDR, it's certainly easier to use. Uh, the 4K at 60 frames per second is cut and dry. So you, you kind of have to balance those. You could very conceivably, with some time and effort, set up the 5040UB using its four pretty decent out-of-the-box picture modes. Um, you know, that's all you'd have to switch between. You could set that up as, as harmony activities or a harmony sequence. Uh, but you probably we'll end up having to dig into that gamma slider at some point. And it's not as easy to, as you certainly can't adjust it on the fly nearly as easily. So you kind of got to weigh those, you know, is the 5050s convenience and slightly brighter, slightly sharper, certainly easier to use HDR worth about twice the price right now. Um, it could be justified for some people and other people will say, nope, I'm willing to take the time. I'll set up my 5040 and I'll manually switch between picture modes. All right. So let's see. I'm going to cut off questions there. Uh, what I'll say is we have quite a few still left on the list, but I know uh, Tom would like to weigh in on Ryan's question. He was 19 this week. Uh, Jason H was 20. Ben F was 21. And then we also had questions from Jules, uh, more from Nick B, more from Damien, uh, Daniel W is on the list, and Andrew who wrote a question on Twitter. So all of those are in the queue. We'll be getting to them next week. 
but you know what? I'm going to carry on and read through a couple of reviews that were sent to us uh, by listeners because we actually requested uh, Nick uh, was the fellow who was actually going to go to HT Markets uh, showroom in person, uh, their showroom in Chicago, sit in the uh, HT Design home theater recliners that they have available for uh, customers to try out there. And we asked him like, hey, if you do that, get back to us. Let us know firsthand experience what these were like. So Nick kindly did that for us. So first of all, we should know Nick is six foot four and he says he's about 200 pounds. So, you know, he's taller than average. He's certainly, he's uh, what, like uh, 10 inches taller than I am. I'm a short guy. I'm only five foot six. So we would definitely have uh, different comfort levels, I would think, for his chairs. So we should know that Nick is a tall person. Uh, immediately, he noticed that a few of the models were clearly better suited to people who are shorter than himself. So he didn't spend much time on the Somerset or the Paget. Uh, he did sit in them for a moment. He's like, they're actually still comfortable. But for him, uh, understandably, he wanted a taller headrest. It would be more comfortable for him. So as a basic trend, uh, he said the, you know, the looks and the feel of quality overall, it did sort of go up in lockstep with the prices. As you went up in the price range, uh, the looks got a bit nicer, um, you know, the quality of, the, of all the finishing and the stitching and everything, it just it got that little bit nicer as you went up in price. But all of the seats, as we mentioned in our interview with Alan, um, you know, all of them have uh, room in the armrests. Uh, they've all got uh, uh, drawers. Uh, what do you call them? Like, you know, like a, a lid that lifts up and storage in the armrest. All of them have that. All of them come with tray tables. Uh, it's not an add on feature. He actually mentioned that the tray tables themselves are really nice. He was surprised at how good the quality was of the tray tables. So feature wise, uh, pretty, really, really good across the board. But that overall feeling of quality uh, did go up as price went up. So the standouts to him were the Clark, which is their most expensive model. And for him, the Southampton and East Hampton. Now, those two are basically the same seat, but just with higher quality leather on the Southampton. The East Hampton is um, like a less expensive uh, uh, leather match where it's vinyl everywhere that you don't touch and then actual leather where you do touch. And the Southampton is just higher quality leather. So very similar seats. Um, those are all larger seats. And he found that those three had the best lumbar support, which was really important to him. Uh, the Clark actually has power lumbar support and it has uh, memory slots so that you can get the position exactly where you like it set that as a memory and then when you put you know seat back d recline uh you can just hit the memory button it's like um you know a power seat in your car it's got a memory slot so that was really cool and it's the only one that has that feature but the price was significantly higher and nick didn't completely love the way that the power headrest adjusted itself on the clark so he was like that was enough to talk himself down to the much less expensive he got down to the east hampton he's like this is good. It's got the lumbar support. It's the high, it's the larger chair, the higher headrest. And he's like, you know what? I'll put a neck pillow behind my head to adjust the tilt of my head. I don't need a power headrest. And that was what he settled on. So he ended up with these Tamptons. And I'm really glad that you were able to find that, get it at the price that you wanted and the comfort that you wanted and everything. But he sat in pretty much everything that was there. So there's the Belmont and he thought that had the best power headrest it's the only one where its headrest moves upward as it tilts forward so for someone who's taller like him that worked really really well um and uh but but he didn't feel that the lumbar support was quite as good on that seat so that was pretty much the reason that he didn't go for that one but he liked that power headrest design the best uh there's the sheffield which is one of their newer models and he says that one is basically it felt the most like sitting in memory foam it, out of all the models it conformed to like whoever's sitting in it it conforms to your shape and it, and it had that more sort of uh, plush type of feel to it but it's towards the higher end of their prices and he would actually prefer something with like a firmer feel to the seat so again you know somebody's going to listen to that and go oh that is exactly what I want uh, but he got to sit in it for person and know for himself like as comfortable as it is he didn't want something quite that cushiony feeling uh, and conforming feeling he wanted firmer so that's great to know uh, there's the Addison that is their simplest seat it's the narrowest it's the least expensive or at least available as the least expensive outside of the uh, models that are only manual recline he was only considering power recline so he's like totally fine but he found the East Hampton was a better fit for his size and um, yeah he liked the lumbar support again that was really important to him and the East Hampton really had that so one thing that Nick did wonder about, uh, particularly regarding that lumbar support that he was really looking for, was whether the stuffing in the back of the seat would compress or wear out over time. I've certainly had that. I, you know, I bought a uh, sofa years ago that you know wasn't a very expensive sofa, and it's like, yeah, all that padding just <laughs> got compressed and shrunk down. And 
all that type of stuff wore out uh, and, and not that long. So sometimes buying high quality is nicer. So anyway, he mentioned that HT Market actually had an East Hampton on hand that they've kept around in their showroom for over six years now, specifically so they can show how it holds up over time. So Nick said when he sat on it, he could feel it wasn't quite as firm anymore as the brand new East Hampton. Uh, but it had held up really well and like hundreds if not thousands of people have sat in that seat so it's been used over these six years he's like it's it's held up quite well it, it has softened a bit which is expected but the salesperson gave him some really good tips which are that most people do tend to sit in only one or two seats much more than the others like Nick was buying six and it'll probably be uh, him and his wife sitting in two out of those six seats most of the time so he was like if the stuffing starts to compress in the back just swap out the seat backs because the seat back are all removable on all the HD design home theater recliners. So just swap the seat packs with some of the lesser used seats. And that's a way you can certainly prolong the life. And then they're like, for a seat back, uh, they can order just the seat back of any seat. Uh, so you're not having to buy an entirely new seat. You could get just a replacement seat back. And with something like the East Hampton, which is a simple seat back, there's no power in the East Hampton seat back or anything like that. It's just a static seat back. It's less than $100 to get just the seat back. So that completely put Nick's mind at ease regarding longevity. And he went with the East Hamptons, really happy with that choice. So thank you, Nick. Great to have firsthand accounting of what those various seat models feel like. So last for today, I'm going to talk about uh, Damien D. He wanted to share his thoughts on the Ascend Acoustics SE series speakers. He got three of the CMT340 SE large bookshelf speakers uh, across the front, and then he got HTM200 SE, the sealed design that can be wall-mounted for his surrounds. Uh, so he wrote in a lot. Uh, he, he talked about pretty much all the things that he wanted and went into detail. So I truncated it down to basically his summary because I think this sums things up nicely the way that Damien wrote them. So these are his words. He says, I am thoroughly impressed with these speakers, though they're not as pretty as his initial first choice, which were the RBH Impression Series, but those have sadly been discontinued. He says they're not as pretty, but he has no regrets. The Ascends, he says literally, he means figuratively, disappear into the room when the lights go off. It's almost eerie how that textured black finish of the SE series reflects so little light. I'll also mention uh, that it uh, rejects fingerprints very nicely as well too. So yeah, I, I like that matte black finish. Doesn't look as pretty in pictures when you first take them out of your box. You're like, oh, these are plain black boxes, but when you're in a projection setup and the lights go out, they're not reflecting any light off your projector. They disappear into the black background. So that's really cool. So he says, are these my forever speakers? Probably not. However, the capability of these speakers is so high for their price point that any upgrade would likely be largely just for form or looks and minimally for function and sound quality. Um, I can kind of agree. I mean, they're, that's one of the reasons they're one of my favorites is because I often say like to get an actual sound quality upgrade, you got to go many multiples of their price. And to me, that means they're a really excellent value. So he says, what are some of the cons of these speakers? Well, He'd like to have magnetic grills. Uh, you know, he said he can't imagine that that feature costs that much, but um, not that big a deal because you're either going to have the grills on or off. And then he wasn't a huge fan of the particular five-way binding post that they use uh, on Ascend. They just kind of stick out the back. Um, so they're just, they're just hanging out there. But he's like, to be fair, that's like really nitpicky. And yeah, that's nothing to do with the uh, sound quality or anything in those. Um, so who are these speakers for, according to Dami? He says, well, the Ascend Acoust X, uh, Acoustics SE series speakers are what he would call pro-intermediate speakers. That would be his term. Uh, they're clearly an upgrade from beginner speakers uh, coming from more budget-focused speakers. Uh, yet the experienced listener could uh, appreciate these speakers and give uh, they give all the performance without any of the jewelry jewelry, as he calls it. They're not fancy looking, but all the money was put into the sound. So this whole review of his has come together together while he's still in the process of treating his room. Uh, he's run Odyssey multiple times, and now he's decided to uh, cut that off at five kilohertz. He doesn't have it um, do any equalization above five, five kilohertz, but he imagines that the sound will only get better as he treats more of his reflections. So he says he truly understands why I have often said that if you get these Ascend speakers and you don't like what you're hearing, 
it's not the fault of the speakers. They are just telling it like it is. Uh, I consider them more like tools. I consider them a great way to reduce the number of variables that you're considering. It's like, nah, these are these are playing what the signal told them to play. Uh, very little uh, less, very little more. They're, they're very accurate and transparent to the signal that's coming in. So he says, thanks for the recommendation. He's very happy with that. I remember I was chatting with him on Twitter, going back and forth quite a bit because he was uh, he was agonizing over which speakers to order. And I'm like, I just want you to get the Ascends. Because I'm like, if, if you don't like those, then we know that you want something with a more colored sound. And it has turned out that uh, he agrees with that. And even the plain looks turned out to be an advantage because he's using a projection setup and they reflect no light. So that brings us to the end of this week's podcast. Um, Yes, as things are a little bit crazy and, uh, and you know, Tom's kids are home from school all the time now for however long uh, this continues to go on, uh, you know, we're going to muddle through the best that we can, try and give people a little bit respite, talk about something very fun and enjoyable. And hey, home theater makes a whole lot of sense when a lot of us are trying to social distance ourselves, stay away from getting infected or infecting others around us. It's really important that we do that. Hopefully we can make sure that our healthcare systems do not get overrun and that we're being responsible taking care of ourselves but also looking out for everyone around us that we care about as well so uh please stick with us we're gonna be here we're still gonna be talking about home theater schedules might have to change people might have to cut out in the middle of things but uh but but we're gonna truck along and continue answering home theater and av questions and if you want your question answered just send it to us by email question at avrant.com that's our email address our website of course is avrant.com and we're happy to continue answering home theater and av questions so i'd like to thank our listeners of the week this week it's going to be our 110 patrons over at patreon.com slash avrant podcast think of it as a voluntary subscription if you'd like to continue donating to this podcast on a regular basis keep the lights on around here keep our uh, bandwidth and hosting fees under control and if you'd like to make a one-time donation we have paypal as well come to our website avrant.com the right hand side says support avrant and that will take you to paypal uh let's see have we we we've finished everything this week right i haven't forgotten everything we've shown the images we've talked about things we've thanked everyone who supported us uh so on behalf of tom andry this has been avrant i'm rob h now go out and listen to something